Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. This is your host, Adam Graham, from more or less the present day. And we are bringing you, in this YouTube video, a week of archive programs from the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. Now, these were recorded several years ago, are being posted exactly as they were, except I am cutting the opening for all but the first episode to exclude the theme music and as much front matter as I can, and then also cutting down the end to remove some of that contact information. Now, any specific offers or deals offered on the podcast are not actually valid unless they are shown on our current website at greatdetectives.net. This video does contain chapters, so if you don't want to listen to all of the programs in the week, you can skip around the ones that you want to listen to just like the original listeners did. Now it's time for our archive programs. Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio, and we're here for another great week, um, beginning with Box 13. I know, I've, I, on the Dragnet Show, I've received feedback uh, that it's important to a lot of people that we get the right dates uh, on the show, so we get a date on the show. Um, well, th if it hadn't been for... Uh, Dennis, uh, Dennis's Box 13 log at Digital Deli. Uh, it's digitaldeliftp.com. Uh, we would have had the wrong dates. Um, one of the challenges with Box 13 is that it aired out east um, and, um, on a, a mutual affiliate and then was syndicated across the country. So there were a lot of uh, air dates. However, Dennis has tracked down the first and original air dates. And so we made sure the uh, dates reflected reality. Um, and it, it, it's nice. He does some pretty good research over there um, in terms of getting the dates to align exactly. Unfortunately, he hasn't gotten to every show. So uh, for some, we just have to go with the prevailing information which is pretty close to right, usually. It's not as precise as the signing of the Declaration of Independence on July 4, 1776, but it'll do. Um, before we get started, I want to uh, encourage you, uh, if you want to have great hosting, or even just to get a good deal on a great second domain, domain check out our host, one and one and also help to support the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. Go to hosting.greatdetectives.net. But without any further ado, let's go ahead and get into our seventh episode of Box 13. <laughs> Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13. Box 13. Box 13. Box 13. He looked deeply into her eyes, which reflected his mood like twin lakes of azure blue. Azure blue. Why does a woman always have to have azure eyes? Why couldn't they be fire engine red? Huh. As his muscular arms tightened around her fragile... Susie. Oh, Mr. Holliday, I'm not fragile, but I'm sure scared. Somebody's been following me. With those legs? Why not? I was petrified, afraid to look back even. His footsteps kept going click, 
cluck, click, cluck. Real sinister like. Oh, I bet that's him now. Mr. Click Cluck? Oh, Mr. Holiday, he followed me all the way from box 13. <laughs> And now, Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, this is a brand new twist. Besides a message from Box 13, Susie has brought a mysterious caller. Somebody who wants in, but definitely. Don't answer it, Mr. Holliday. Now, now, Susie. You didn't see this person, huh? No, I, I just felt him following me like a, uh, like a phantom. Except his heels went click, cluck, click, cluck. Oh. That doesn't sound so dangerous. Let's take a chance. Come in. Oh. <laughs> Silly me. I ought to be ashamed for being such a fraidy cat. Look who it is. Well, Susie, who is it? I don't know. Who are you, mister? My name is George Flitt. I'm a, a detective. And you're Dan Holliday, the writer. It's, it's on the door. A detective, huh? <laughs> Why, well, isn't any bigger than me. But I have nerves of steel and the heart of a lion. Oh, oh, I see. And what brings you here, Mr. Flitt? Well... Who? <laughs> Nerves of steel. Heart of a lion. <laughs> that was no fair, girlie. You took me by surprise. Susie. Now, Mr. Flitt. Why don't you open the envelope I put in box 13? Here it is, Mr. Holliday. Oh, thanks. Open it. I'm all goose lump. Okay. Well, what do you know? Why, there's nothing written on the paper. Hmm. How about that, Flip? See how clever I am? I put that envelope in box 13 as bait. As bait? Yes, I knew it would lead me to the person who put the ad in the Star Times, Adventure Wanted. Well, go any place and do anything. Very clever, Mr. Flip. Oh, what made your footsteps go click, cluck, click, cluck? <laughs> oh, that. I lost the metal cleat off of one of my heels. Oh. Well, now that you've discovered me, Mr. Flip, what? Mr. Holliday, I'd say you're just the man for the job. Job? Something exciting, you hope, huh, Mr. Holliday? I'd handle it myself, only I'm so tiny. Besides, I've done mostly divorce work. <laughs> just the right height for keyholes. But uh, about the job? Well, I'm coming to that. Uh, Mr. Gilbert Bolton sent me $50 just to attend the party tonight. $50? I should have been a detective. Oh, you can be. I'll split with you if you'll go to the affair in my place as me. We got the money. What's the catch? Oh, there's really no catch. Uh, only thing Mr. Bolton said was there might be a little uh, bloodshed. Well, well, well. This holiday is the wackiest situation yet from good old Box 13. Yes, Holiday, you must be hard up for story ideas. Hard up for brains, too. Otherwise, why are you riding with George Flitt, detective, in his hot rod jalopy? Destination, bloodshed. And you've never met this Bolton who's having the party? No, but he phoned and explained that the party is going to be at his nephew's place, uh, Kenneth Bolton. Kenneth, huh? Uh, what about the bloodshed? Well, as I understand it, Kenneth's father, that is, uh, Gilbert Bolton's brother, committed suicide not so long ago. Oh. Uh -huh. Gilbert said the boy is suffering from neurasthenia, I, I think he said. Psychoneurotic, huh? Uh, yes. On account of the way his father died, uh, Gilbert's afraid the boy may take his own life tonight. Why tonight, especially? Well, it seems that Kenneth drinks a lot at these parties and gets depressed. And my job is... To see that he doesn't commit suicide tonight. I've looked forward to more pleasant evenings. I, I think that's the place up ahead with all the lights on. Yeah, that's the address you mentioned. Hmm, we must be about 15 miles from town. Uh, 14 and 7 tenths by my speedometer. Well, Flit, I may as well take off. What are you going to do? 
Oh, I'll sit here in my car and listen to the radio, sort of keep my eye on things from the outside. Good idea. See you later, then. Here we go again, Holiday. Oops, the name's George Flitt, detective. Remember? Beyond this door, who knows? But it's a beautiful house. A beautiful night. And a beautiful girl. Good evening. Oh, good evening. I'm looking for Mr. Gilbert Bolton. Won't you come in? And you are... Uh, uh, George Flitt. You say you're George Flitt? That's right. I'm Rita Martin. How do you do? Now, let's go in and find Gilbert Bolton, Mr. Flitt. <laughs> Oh, Holiday, here's a jungle cat. A vampire right of Terry and the Pirates. That jet black hair, those heavy lidded eyes. That glistening crimson mouth. And something else. Yes, heavy, clawing, sensuous. A perfume such as you've never known before. That's something to remember this Rita Martin by. Mm hmm. <laughs> Oh, Gilbert. Yes, Rita. Gilbert Bolton, this is George Flitt. George, how do you do, Mr. Flitt? Mr. Bolton? If you'll excuse me, gentlemen, I'll see you all a bit later. So, you're George Flitt, the detective. Yes, that's right. Your voice seemed, well, different over the phone. Well, you know, detectives, many disguises, many voices. <laughs> Got to keep them confused, you know. Somehow I picked at you differently. Oh? Well, no matter. You know why you're here. Yes, to keep my eye on your nephew, Kenneth Fulton. More than that, to keep him from chilling himself. The way this man looks at you, Holiday. So cool, so calculating. With piercing eyes that thud against the back of your skull. You could be one of two men. A man of distinction or a man of extinction. Okay, Mr. Bolton, I'll keep your nephew alive. That's your job. But what makes you think the boy wants to commit suicide? Well, since his father, my brother, took his life, Kenneth has been extremely upset. It's only natural, Mr. Bolton. I know, but I've heard Kenneth threaten suicide, and it's got me worried. Anyone else heard him? Yes, Miss Martin. Uh, anyone else? What do you mean, anyone else? I just wondered if anyone else had heard him make these threats. I really wouldn't know. It's enough that Rita and I know about it. How does Rita figure in this picture? Aren't you being a bit presumptuous, Mr. Flitt? A detective likes to know these things. Miss Martin is an old friend of the family. Oh, there's Kenneth now. I'll bring him over. Just as Gilbert Fulton passed me, there was something familiar about him. What was it? Who was it? Go on, think, Holiday. It may be an important clue. But here they come. The man of extinction and a typical boy from Princeton or Yale or Harvard. George Flitt, my nephew, Kenneth Bolton. Glad to meet you. How do you do? Enjoying yourself, Mr. Flitt? Very much. How about you? Oh, so-so. These parties get to be a boy, huh? Kenneth hasn't been quite himself since the tragedy. Must you always bring that up, Uncle? But you know you've been terribly upset, Kenneth. So I've been upset. Why talk about it? Oh, Mr. Flitt. Yes? Will you come with me for a moment? Oh, I sure. It's so close in here that I thought a breath of air. That suits me. In the garden. The garden it is. Hmm. Nice. A moon, too. Mm -hmm. Lovely, lovely night. Ah, the scent of those flowers. Exquisite, isn't it? Uh-huh. But not to compare with your perfume. You noticed it. Yes, it was so unusual. It's called Whispering Gown. Whispering Gown? Mm, I like the name. Say. Yes? I know where they got that name. Oh? From Cerno de Bergerac. The passage where he describes Roxanne. Across my life, one whispering silken gown. That was lovely. You're quite literary, aren't you, Mr. Blake? Well, yes and no. Just what do you do? Gilbert Bolton didn't tell you? No. 
No, but let's sit on this bench and you tell me all about yourself. As you come close to her, you get another whiff of... And suddenly you've got it. That's what bothers you about Gilbert Bolton. Her perfume rubbed off on him. If it isn't an old friend of the family, she's young and a close friend of Gilbert Bolton's. She's brought you out here for a reason. Well, aren't you going to sit down? Oh, I sure, but uh, just a minute. I want to buy some cigarettes. I've got plenty of cigarettes. Uh, I'll be right back. Something about this whole setup is as phony as a china egg. And as the crooks in your story say, better case a joint before you go inside. There. There's a window. Just pull the bushes back. Let's take a gander. Well, everything looks on the up and up. Kenneth with a drink on the table beside him, and there's his uncle coming up. Hmm. He set another full drink right beside Kenneth. Hey, what else is he doing? You'd better get in there, Holiday, and fast. Mind if I, I join you, gentlemen? No, not at all, not at all. You appeared quite uh, suddenly. Care for a drink, Mr. Plitt? Here, I haven't touched this one. No, no, let me fix Mr. Flitter a fresh drink. <laughs> I think I'll just have one of these hors d'oeuvres. Hey, what's it? My drink. Oh, I'm... I'm sorry. Flit, you... You awkward idiot. Oh, excuse me. Yes, Uncle. Accidents will happen. I didn't really feel like another drink. It was your idea, remember? Well, Mr. Flit, were you able to borrow some cigarettes? I was ambushed by... Or does. Glad you're here, Rita. I have a proposal to make. Yes? What say we all run up to my penthouse for a while? Oh, sounds good. What do you say, Mr. Flynn? Fine. I think a change of scenery would be nice. You'll enjoy the view overlooking Green Hill Park from the penthouse, Mr. Flint. Oh, good. What's the address? Uh, I tell you what, Mr. Flint. Rita, Kenneth, and myself will go ahead in my car. Then you can follow us in yours. Well, maybe I'd better go with Mr. Flint. Keep him company. No, I'd like you with me, Kenneth. There's something I uh, want to discuss with you. Important. Well, per perhaps I should have the address in case I lose you. you that, know, that won't be necessary. Uh, just follow me. Of course, Holiday, you could be wrong, but it looks like Gilbert Bolton isn't too anxious to have you find his penthouse. Uh, but you're a suspicious lad, Holiday. You've created so many diabolical characters for so many fiendish plots. Maybe you, maybe you've become a little touched. Time's a waste on holiday. Get to a phone. Ah, there it is, end of the hallway. Now, if Mac's on duty in the morgue of the Star Times, we'll ask a few questions. Star Times reference room. Hello, Mac. This is Dan Holiday. Ah, oh, Danny, what can I do you for? Say, so you got anything on the Bolton suicide? Just filed those clips away yesterday. And even if this is a clips joint, I won't charge you a penny. <laughs> Clips joint. You get it, Dan? <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 I get it. What about Bolton? Poisoned himself. Left all his dough to his son, name of Kenneth. Anything else? Well, there was something about Bolton's brother, uh, Gilbert. He sort of taken over and helping the boy. Kid was pretty broke up. Hey, Dan. Hey, did you hang up? No, but someone did. Someone was listening on another extension. <laughs> Hey, this is the fastest hot rod I've ever driven. We're keeping right up with a Bolton. And he's doing 70. <laughs> Wait until you shift into high gear. Uh, where are we going? To a penthouse, I hope. Gilbert Bolton's. Hmm. Uh, what happened at the party? Oh, Rita Martin tried to get me into the garden, and I got suspicious. Trying to keep you away from your job, wasn't she? Yeah, so I rushed back into the house, stopping to case the joint through a window. Case the joint? <laughs> a detective talk. Yeah, then I got into trouble with Bolton. Well, how? By knocking a drink from his nephew's hand. Huh? Uh, what did the uncle do? Got insulting. Then all of a sudden he suggested going to his penthouse. Watch it, watch it. He, he's slowing down. Yeah, I wonder what his idea is. Oh, he's just slowing down with that train. But he only slowed down for a second. Look at him go. I know what he's doing. He's trying to beat that train to the crossing. He's trying to lose us. Step on the gas. Step on the gas, Mr. Holiday. Okay. Mr. Holiday, are we going to make it? He made it, but I don't know about us. Help! 
You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. And now, back to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Next time I want such a close shave, I'll see my barber. Yeah, me too. Gosh, Mr. Holliday, I thought I could handle this hot rod. But the way you whipped her off the road just short of those tracks, I... Not a scratch on her. Lucky us. Oh, that train must be a mile long. By the time it passes, Bolton can be in Alaska. What's the address of this penthouse? You're asking me. All I know is it overlooks Green Hill Park. Our next stop... <laughs> Well, George, Green Hill Park. <laughs> I bet all these buildings have penthouses. We'll try them all until we hit the right one. I'll go around this side of the park. Okay, and I'll try the buildings around the other side. Bolton's got to be in one. Do you have a Mr. Bolton in your penthouse? No one here by that name. A Bolton in the penthouse? No, but uh, we have a Botsford in the basement. Why, yes, Mr. Gilbert Bolton came in a short time ago. Hello? No, with a lady and gentleman. Want to go up? Oh, please. Did Mr. Bolton say anything about expecting more guests? No, sir. Do me a favor. If a little fellow with a squeaky voice shows up asking for Bolton, tell him I'm here, will you? Dan Holliday. Yes, sir. Oh, here you are. Thank you, sir. Your floor, sir. Uh, that's the penthouse door over there. Right. I've got a sneaking hunch I won't be welcome. Flip, how did you get up here? You, uh, you didn't expect me? Yes, yes, of course, but... You've earned your money. You can... Well, you can go home now. I'm sorry, Miss Maud, but Mr. Bolton hired me. It's up to him to fire me. But he's not here. He and Kenneth both went out. May I come in and wait? No. Goodbye. Now what? Now what does the intrepid hero of my stories do? Hmm. He looks for another door. Like that one. He tries it. It's open. It leads into a hallway. And there's yet another door. The service entrance to Bolton's penthouse. And ten to one, it's locked, bolted, and barred. Maybe even nailed shut. You're some gambler, Holiday. Offer ten to one and lose. The door's open. Well, here we go again. Quiet holiday. Ah, there's a door leading to the terrace and voices. Now get your ear up, holiday. But don't let them see you. Don't you think it's a little chilly out here, Uncle? Let's go inside. Chilly, Kenneth? I'm really very comfortable. Here's the view I was telling you about, Kenneth. Better lean over the rail a bit to see around that turret. Well, don't push against me, Uncle. That's a ten-story drop. Now... Look over there, Kenneth. Uncle Gil! Kenneth, let's get away from that rail! Don't flip you. Don't have to throw me back. Better than having your uncle throw you forward. What's the meaning of this outrage? How did you get in here anyway? I'm going to call the police. Fine, and save me the trouble. Look, Kenneth, I was hired to keep you from committing suicide. Suicide? Who, me? Yeah, but instead I'm keeping you from being murdered. Feel in your coat pocket. Ignore him, Kenneth. He doesn't know what he's talking about. A bottle? It's marked poison. Yeah, I saw your uncle planted in your pocket through the garden window. He wanted to make it look like you poisoned that drink I knocked from your hand. Stop right there, Holiday. This isn't a cap pistol. You too, Kenneth. Don't move. Well, you must be crazy, Uncle Gil. And you knew I was Dan Holiday all along, huh? Of course. I've seen your picture in the book review pages. And I caught you a telephone conversation at the Star Times. On the extension. You get around. I can't believe this. 
You, you, my uncle. What's the play now, Bolton? Well, first I walk over to Kenneth and knock him out with his gun. No, no more, Holiday. I've still got you covered. Oh? And now that you've knocked out your nephew, what's your next move? Mr. Holiday, before I heave him over the rail to make it look like suicide, I'm going to shoot you. Oh, fine. Then I'll wipe my fingerprints off this gun and press my nephew's hand around the butt. Hmm. His fingerprints on the gun will prove he shot me, huh? But what about a motive? Very simple. You tried to stop him from jumping off the terrace. And you're supposed to invent plots, Mr. Holliday. But they'll trace the gun to you, Bolton. Oh, no. It's Kenneth's gun. I took it from his room. And you wanted a detective on hand to throw off suspicion? Yes, Mr. Holliday. Who'd suspect Gilbert of murder when he'd hired a detective to protect Kenneth? But why? Why do you want to kill your nephew? Let's say I borrowed quite a large sum I can't make good. Oh. Embezzlement, huh? And you need Kenneth's inheritance to keep out of jail. Wouldn't he lend you the money? Not the amount we need. We? Obviously. So, we're taking it all. Clever, eh, Holiday? You're killing me. You're so right. Get rid of whoever it is, Rita. If that isn't help, Holiday, forget about writing the great American novel. No room in a coffin for typing. I tell you, you really can't. I'm trying to go in and see. I know. I tell you, you can't come in. I tell you, I'm trying to see. I know Dan Holiday's in here and nobody. Never mind, Rita. I couldn't stop him. I've got plenty of bullets. Welcome to the party, George. Hello, Mr. Holiday. A gun. Let me out of here. Stop. Stop or I'll shoot. Ah! Watch out. Thanks for the distraction. Flip. Now, Mr. Gilbert Bolton, you know how your nephew feels. Well, I know how it feels to be on the right end of this Smith and Wesson. You knocked him out. What are you going to do? Do? Well, since the party's getting dull, let's invite a few more boys. Say, from headquarters. <laughs> This is Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Come in. Susie. Ah, uh, Mr. George Flitt, detective. How's the arm, Mr. Flitt? Oh, it's uh, healing up fine. One of the bullets just grazed me. You know, I bled quite a lot. Say, wasn't that awful, them trying to kill that boy? And he really wasn't psycho what you might call it at all. Uh, Bolton cooked that up to support the suicide story. Oh. What's going to happen to them, Mr. Holliday? Well, they've got Bolton for embezzlement and attempted murder. They're holding Rita as his accomplice. And she was such a beautiful girl and so sweet, too. Yes, George, you can say that again. H how's the rod hot these days, Mr. Flitt? Hot rod, Susie. Hot rod, rod hot, red hot. Oh, how is it anyway? Red hot. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, it's fine. And Mr. Holliday, hmm? even if I did run away from that gun, I really do have the heart of a lion. But of course, George. Only thing is, <laughs> it's a scaredy cat lion. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. <laughs> Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is directed by Ted Hediger. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager with an original story 
by Larry Kraft. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. This is a Mayfair production. Welcome back. An exciting adventure from Dan Holliday. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, the title, of course, uh, if, if you saw it, is, is a bit of a pun, um, and an easy pun at that, a short assignment. Um, the, the one thing that's nice um, about uh, old-time radio is if you can make a short voice, you can play a short actor. Um, if you can make a tall voice, uh, you can play a tall actor, um, and as as um, um, and as there's a lot of variance in there, as long as you can uh, be believable, uh, you really have a lot more flexibility than you do on television. Uh, because to bend that line between short and tall, uh, you really needed some camera tricks. So no need for that here. Uh, great episode. Lots of fun out. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. Uh, bringing you the seventh episode of Pat Novak for Hire that we've got uh, from the 1949 season. Um, th this episode uh, focuses on uh, a blackmail plot. There's a couple of really interesting things that happen. Uh, plus, if you like, um, if you like the uh, uh, Pat Novak speak. This has got to, to be just some of the best insults, uh, I'm telling you. You're going to really enjoy this particular episode. Uh, before we get started, I, I do want to let you know briefly about Netflix. Netflix is great uh, because it allows you to be able to choose what you want to watch. Uh, so many times you go to a video store, go to one of those uh, machines, and all you got in there, you got the latest re uh, releases. Um, with Netflix, what makes it so great is that you can choose the films you like, and then Netflix will make suggestions right out of the blue, uh, seemingly, but based on your past choices and the things you said, no, nah, I'm really not going to enjoy that. Um, Netflix is available for a two-week free trial, and we encourage you to try it out. Go to netflix.greatdetectives.net or go to greatdetectives.net and just click on the Netflix banner to, to learn more. And if you've got an Xbox 360 or a PlayStation 3, you are able to stream uh, videos directly to your television now. Uh, but without any further ado, let's go ahead and get into this episode uh, uh, Pat Novak for Hire, Joe Candano. Pat Novak for Hire. sign out in front of my office says, Pat Novak for hire. It's an easy way to put it, because if you're going to make a living down on the waterfront in San Francisco, you got to do everything but run for office. I rent boats and kick around a few scruples if the price is right. It's a living, and if anything goes wrong, you can always get your mother a visitor's pass. If you do get in trouble, you go first class all the way. I found that out when I first met Doreen Wilde. It was almost dark, and I was sitting in the office with the door open when she first showed up. Showed up's the right word. The wind was blowing outside and pushed her dress tightly against her legs as she walked in. 
She was young. From what I could see, she made Cleopatra look like Apple Mary. She had a voice like a bowl of warm stew. Hello. Are you Mr. Novak? That's my story. I'm Doreen Wilde. Mind if I sit down? On your desk here? You'll block the view. You'll get used to the new one. There. Now lean back and let me look at you. Hmm. I want to hire you, Mr. Novak. After the look or before? You've got a power complex, darling. You know a man named Joe Condono? Oh, he's a gambler out on Geary Street. Friend of yours? I don't dislike him that much. We have business connections. That's why I want to hire you. To give him some money tonight. A needy case or a bad debt? A bad debt. Condano has an IOU from my brother for $10,000. You can go from there. Not if I'm supposed to say it was a fixed game. Condano's been around a long time. Yes. That's right. There are only two kinds of gamblers in this town, honest ones and dead ones. So if your brother owes ten grand, he better pay. That's why I'm hiring you. Just pay off Condano and make sure you get the pictures. Pictures of the Grand Canyon, huh? We'll talk about my past some other time. Well, for the moment, we'll just say you're photogenic. Huh? That's right. Your brother can't get the ten grand, so Condano's shaking you down. Yes. I'll bet you make a nice rattle. How did Condana get the pictures? My brother gave them to him. You got a charming brother. You see only his better side. Will you do the job for a hundred dollars? How long is it going to take? Two hours, maybe. You'll have to meet with my brother. To meet with your brother, a hundred bucks is coolie wages. He'll give you the information, then you can see Condano. Where do I meet your brother? Room seven twenty nine, the Dixie Hotel. He'll be there about 8.30. That packing crate down on Powell Street? Your brother's a cutie. I know why knows it wouldn't go in there. We'll meet you there at 8.30. Oh? You gonna be there? Yeah. Do you mind? I can stand it. Good. Do you carry a spare battery for that gleam in your eye? Your hundred bucks covers that, too. See you at 8.30. (laughs) She smiled at me, and I felt like a guy that just found an oil well in the basement. Well, there were a lot of things about the deal I didn't like, but she kind of made you forget. I kept remembering her as she walked out of there with a slow, easy gait. She had knee action that'd make a Nash jealous. Well, I hit the Dixie Hotel about 8.25. It was the kind of a hotel that has a 4 a.m. checkout rule. There were two or three guys sitting around reading tip sheets, and... Over in the corner, a couple of well-upholstered gals were talking about recipes, I guess. The desk clerk was the worst of the lot. He looked like a guy that might have been expelled from Alcatraz. Nobody looked up as I walked through. When I got to 729, I knocked. There was no answer, so I opened the door and walked in. There was a bed lamp on and a lot of smoke in the room. Through the smoke, I could pick out the committee. They were crazy about me. Come on in. Looking for someone? Yeah, yeah, but she's got a better figure than you. Close the door. No, she's not here. I'll just run along. Close the door, mister. You need the ventilation. I said close the door. Now sit down. Sit down on the bed there. You're a tough host. So I'm broken hearted. Just be a good boy now and give it to me, huh? You got the wrong guy. You give it to me fast, mister. I don't know what you're talking about. I came up here to meet somebody. Already met him. I've run across better people in sewers. Now, look, meathead, I'm only going to say this once more, so make a copy. You got the wrong guy. You think I got something? I haven't got it. No. No, so you and your playmates swing out of here in your tails. I never saw you until three minutes ago, and I'm tired of the friendship already. All right. Eddie. Yeah? Go through this guy's coat. Yeah, sure. Now, wash your hands, Junior, and then put them in your own pockets. Oh. Uh, you, uh, you got a favorite profile, fella? Hmm? Because I'm going to put this gun on one side. Take your choice. <laughs> Grab him, hold him up. <laughs> All right, Eddie. Now you don't have to wash your hands. <laughs> I woke up with a head the size of Rhode Island. I rolled over and tried to get up, but I was about as strong as a moth in a wind tunnel. The room was dark, and I couldn't see very well. It was a stale, musty odor. Could have been a marathon dancer's dressing room, with a little fixing up, the sort of place you wouldn't be found dead in. 
There was a guy lying next to me who didn't feel that way about it. One look at the guy and I could see he was dead from the crew cut down. Somebody wrapped a towel around his throat and forgot to say when. I should have got out of there right then, but I used my brain like a bottle of medicine, a small dose every three hours. I stood there, looking down at him. Felt like a guy that's just rolled a seven the second time out. A small chunk of light squeezed through the door, and I could see particles of dust settling on his face. He was lying there, straight and white-faced, with a little bit of scowl as if he didn't like the idea. I went through his wallet and found a few bucks and some identification. Enough to prove he was Frank Wilde, Doreen's brother. Oh, it looked nice and clear. They'd done everything but pin the IOU on his shirt. Well, I couldn't wait around because when Homicide got there, I was going to be as popular as a can of salmon on Friday. Homicide meant Inspector Hellman, a guy that couldn't even make the vice squad. We were as close as a piccolo and a bass trombone. I got to thinking about him and decided to get out of there. It was a good idea five minutes ago. Hello, Novak. Oh, Hellman. Small wake, huh? Just a few close friends. You always drop by room 729 this time of night? I got a bad memory for faces. Who's your friend? His name's Frank Wilde. That's one answer. I was supposed to meet him here at 830. That's another. You got a third? Hmm? Who killed him? I don't know, Hellman. Maybe three or four people. Maybe a pack of lugs from Joe Condano's. Yeah? I think you're modest, Novak. I think maybe you killed him. Oh, yeah, sure. I wrapped a towel around his neck, beat myself to death with a pistol, and jumped into the same grave. Maybe. Oh, stop it, Hellman. That isn't smart. That still leaves you in the running. I came up here to make a hundred bucks. That's all I know about it. Check down at the desk. They'll tell you. I checked on the way up. The desk clerk says room 729 is in your name. Get your dough back, Hellman. You've been hijacked. Yeah? Look up a gal named Doreen Wilde. Who's she? The stiff sister. He got in a jam with Joe Condano and bailed himself out with some pictures. Oh. What kind of pictures? <laughs> you just look her up and find out where she was at 9 o'clock tonight. I got a bird in the hand. And call on Joe Condano. His gunsel's held a convention here tonight. That's too much legwork. You're handy, Novak. I can't afford a bum rap, Hellman. Get yourself another boy. You get me one. It's your hotel room. There's a dead guy in it and you got a bad record. I can make that add up for the D.A. You can't add a pair of zeros without crib notes, Hellman. I can try hard, and I'll be all through in 24 hours. That's how long you got, Novak. You got one day, and you're not going to be lonesome. Because I'm going to put a tail on you the whole time. Well, that'll be fun. I'm going to know where you are every minute. Stop posing, will you? You couldn't follow an elephant across a basketball court. Just stay handy, Novak. I'll be ready. I'm going to fingerprint this room and run that towel through a test. And then I'll be ready. Yeah, you better watch out for that towel. Huh? Remember, when it comes to towels, Hellman, you have to start from scratch. Well, when I left, Hellman was smiling like an Academy Award winner. I didn't blame him, because from my side of the road, things looked rough. From here in, he could play a pat hand and come out all right. There were only two other people, Joe Condano and that girl. I was real worried. So I looked up the only honest guy I know, an ex-doctor and a boozer by the name of Jocko Madigan. Well, he was all right for a guy who tries to drink all the whiskey in the world every night, only some night he's going to make it. I finally found him at the Bellevue Hotel, holed up in the hunt room. He was getting the most he could out of a bottle, old whiskey and young ideas. It was 10 o'clock and he was carrying a bigger load than the Berlin airlift. Oh, ho! <laughs> a drink for Mr. Novak, and one for me. I'll have to catch up. Skip me. You busy, Jocko? I'm deep in the labor of love. What happened to your face? I got a better offer. I'm in a jam, Jocko. You gotta help me. Oh, you're always in a jam. You're the eternal patsy. Also, you're my solitary reason for going on. Forget it, Jocko. Well, you're the last project Providence has allowed me. An hors d'oeuvre that fate has thrown me to nibble on. I'm your conscience, you know. Yeah, all right, all right. You have no conscience of your own. Oh, you have fleeting moments of fright which you confuse as moral sense, but no conscience. All right, let's get off the platform, shall we? I need help quick. Uh, what kind of jam? A big one? Yeah. I woke up about an hour ago holding hands with a dead man. Where? Room 729 at the Dixie Hotel. I hope you changed rooms. Hellman walked in and found me praying for the dead. He's got an idea I did it. A shrewd policeman. That was the second feature. We opened with a pistol whipping by Joe Condano's gunsels. Oh, you got to help me. Would uh, a drink help? Hellman's got a guy tailing me. 
I gotta go slow, Jocko. I want you to hit Condano's place and pick up every scrap of dope, will you? Oh, I'd look out a place in a gambling joint. There's a bar. Tour the joint and find out when the boys got back, huh? Where do you plan to be? Uh, hiding under a rose bush? I'm going up to see a girl. She's the dead guy's sister. Are you going up to extend sympathy? Uh, she's mixed up, too. Condano's holding some blackmail pictures. Hmm. Let's reverse the assignment. Now, look, you see Condano, I'll tag by Doreen Wilde's place. Huh? She must be Harry Wilde's daughter. Who's he? The money crowd, to use a low term. What's he like? A retired octopus. After he got sick of chasing cigarette girls, he settled down to be a social worker. Yeah? Now he's like all social workers. A guy who's embarrassed because he wasn't born poor. And for years, he's been annoying the poor by trying to help them. Hit Condano's place. Now, if you hit anything good, phone me at her apartment. And keep out of trouble. Well, I'd say the same to you if it weren't futile. Good night, lover. <laughs> When I walked out, Geary Street was cold and deserted. The fog had moved in and staked out a claim all the way down to Market Street. There were two Marines across the street arguing, so I didn't hear it at first. When I got out of range, I began to hear the footsteps behind me. I stopped once and the footsteps broke off. I walked on a few yards, and the footsteps were right behind me. They had a familiar ring, and I was sure it was either Hellman or a water buffalo. When I stopped and waited, Hellman walked up. You're out late, Novak. What happened to that tail? He asked for more dough. I put our best man on it. Where are you going? Well, now, I'll bet you get some real good answers on that question. Where are you going, smart boy? Doreen Wilde's apartment. Yeah, why? To find out where she was at 9 o'clock tonight. It won't do you any good. Why? Coroner's report. The guy got knocked off about 7 o'clock tonight. Well, he took a long time dying. That towel was a joke. If he wasn't strangled, he would have been red-faced. He wasn't. Oh, well, now, let me guess, Hellman. He died of lingering malaria. Yeah, he was poisoned. That means he was dead when you brought him in. Well, that changes things, doesn't it? A little. Don't let me keep you, Novak. I'm busy anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Checking your alibi for 7 o'clock. I had no alibi for 7 o'clock. That was right after the girl left my office. Oh, I might be able to dig up a witness, but I wasn't sure. It's like asking a horse if he's going to win the derby. Well... Questions were piling up, so I dropped by Doreen Wilde's apartment. I began to wonder. It was right next door to Condano's place. When she opened the door, I found out what the right kind of breakfast food will do. She was wearing a slack suit without much slack, and she was swaying slightly in a warm, slow way. Well, if there was any rhythm there, it's the kind you hear a thousand miles down the Amazon... And when she said hello, you knew it was all chemistry. Hello, Mr. Novak. I missed you at room 729. This will do just as well. Come in. Yeah. Mm. You're wearing your face a different style. Yeah, Condano's boys didn't like it the old way. I like it. I like it very much. Yeah, what happened to you tonight? Frank was supposed to pick me up. He didn't come by. I see. Your brother finally showed up at the hotel. Oh, yes? Yeah. He paid off that IOU. Is that a quaint way of telling me he's dead? I suppose. Oh, don't sob so loud. You'll wake the neighbors. You know by this time that to me, Frank was a poor excuse at best. Nothing more. Besides, I knew he was dead. Father's down there now identifying the body. Just for the record, who has those pictures now? Condano, I suppose. His boys piled me tonight looking for something. I got the idea it wasn't my social security number. Oh, you've had a busy evening. Yeah, they're going to book me for Frank's murder. Just call me Patsy. You need a drink then, darling? It can wait. Now, look, you're going to save some time if you tell me right now. No, I didn't kill Frank. But I'd be willing to contribute to a shrine for the man who did. How about Condano? I don't know. In fact, I don't know Mr. Condano. Thirsty yet? Yeah, go ahead. Patsy, I'll give you $5,000 to find out who killed Frank. Hmm? Oh, I'll admit it was a good idea killing him, but I want to see the family name cleared up. Why don't you change names? That's easier. Oh, don't be crude. Will you do it? 
I may hang, and you can save your five grand. Here's your drink. The money might help. Should we call it a bargain? Suit yourself. Good. You don't want to stand there balancing that drink. No. That's it. Sit down. You know, you're an interesting guy, Patsy. I like you. Yeah? Yes, don't snowball the statement. Why'd you make it, then? It, it seems safe enough. You sure? You're a little close, Patsy. Are you sure? At this point, I don't care. Come here, baby. Patsy. What's on your mind? Where well, I can buy a desert island cheap. Looks like you got an offer. Oh, father, he'd forgotten his key. Excuse me. Come on over, Father. I want you to meet Mr. Novak. Mr. Novak? Yeah, they think I killed your son. Hi. He's the one I told you about. Oh, yes. Yes, now I remember. Oh, it's probably for me. Hello? Oh. Oh, yes. I think so. I'll, I'll be right there. I've got to run, darlings. Only be gone a while. Father, keep Mr. Novak sober, hmm? I'll pick up from there. Good night, Father. See you soon, Patsy. Hmm. A remarkable girl. She's active, too. Does she always sail out for a night camp? A remarkable girl. More so than Frank? Yes, I, I'm afraid so. You seem to like him better dead. Well, at least he's more harmless that way. But perhaps that sounds... Unbecoming of a father. Well, if he looks better that way, suit yourself. Well, I've never made any attempt to camouflage my feelings. I'm fond of my daughter. And my son, I've loathed. In a casual way. He's a mishap of nature which for years I've been content to blame on his mother. This matter of the gambling debts, uh, case in point. You know about that? Oh, yes. Plus Doreen's liberal contribution to the problem. By the way, Mr. Novak, who did kill him? I thought maybe you did. No. <laughs> I'm not a doer. I just cheer from the grandstand. Uh, excuse me. Hello? Um, it's for you, Mr. Novak. Yeah. Hello. Hello, Patchy. I'm down at Condano. I know that. What'd you find out? Never played two and eight on a roulette wheel. All right, drop the clowning. Well, I found out about your friend. Yeah? They came in about 10 o'clock, so that puts them right in line. No, not anymore. The guy got knocked off at 7 o'clock. Oh, impatient, wasn't he? In that case, you better start looking for a tie-up between the girl and Condano. Not a chance. No? She doesn't even know Condano. Well, she makes friends very quickly, then, because she just walked into his office. <laughs> things were beginning to fall into place. If the girl and Condano were that chummy, they were using those pictures. To squeeze the old man, probably. There was only one thing about it that didn't make sense. Why did Condano's boys beat my brains out if he had the pictures all along? Well, I talked to the old man a while, and then I headed for Condano's joint. They were closed when I got there, so I went home to bed. Oh, I'd have given a good price if Tamara never rolled around. But the sun was eating through the haze the next morning when I walked into Condano's place. A sad old biddy with a mop told me Condano was in his office, so I knocked on the door. Yeah? Hello, Condano. I'm the guy your boys pistol whipped. Novak, come on in. I wouldn't worry. Maybe you'll heal handsome. Thanks. I'm sorry about that, Novak. I'll bet you are. Well, that's the way you'll get it. It won't come engraved. If I say I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, you're full of tears. You gonna shed one when they send me up on a bum murder rap? No, I'll buy you a handkerchief, though. If you got the time, you might tell me what Doreen Wilde was doing in here last night. What do you care? Maybe we're in love. And maybe you're putting the screws on old man Wilde. Hello? Yeah. Did you tell anybody you were coming here? No, just a birdie. It's for you. Yeah. Hello, Jocko. When? Well, from where I'm sitting, it doesn't make sense. No, of course not. Yeah, yeah, I'll let you know. Well, how are you feeling, Condano? Get to the point, Novak. 
They found a dead guy out in the marina this morning. He was shot and banged up badly, but they identified him. What's that to me? Nothing, except they identified him as Joe Condano. Confused? No. It was a guy named Eddie Darrow. Friend of yours? Yeah. Yeah, I guess he was. What does that prove? It proves lots, Novak. It proves unless you find her in a cemetery, never trust a woman. Well, with a good assist from Deep Short, we could make it now. I knew that. Condano was mad about something and the lid was going to blow. I called Hellman. His lid was gone ten minutes ago. He had the murder gun and it belonged to old man Wilde. A messenger walked in and put it on the sergeant's desk a few hours ago with no explanation. That was the clincher. From here on in, it was cakes and ale. I told Hellman what I knew. He picked me up at Geary and Taylor, and we headed for the wild apartment. The girl and the old man were in the living room when we walked in. Everybody had breakfast? Patsy, I didn't know you came out till after dark. Well, we just wanted to call on your old man. Wild, this is Inspector Hellman. Oh, is there anything I can do? You're ambitious, Wild. Hellman's here to arrest you for murder. I'm amused. But not frightened. They might have gone easy on you for killing your son, but not Eddie Darrow. And who is Eddie Darrow? The guy you thought was Condano when you killed him last night. Your daughter was helping him put on that squeeze. She even sent in your gun this morning. Please, Doreen, tell these men. Well, the starting backfield. Hello, Condano. Step aside, Novak. You don't need that gun, Joe. Not for long. All right. Push the girl out there. Push the girl out there. For a gambler, these are bad odds, Joe. Just keep talking. Just keep talking loud. And when you stop, all of a sudden, you'll know I'm through it. You made the first switch, Joe. I didn't trust you, so I sent Eddie Darrow up. He was a good guy, and I liked him. I didn't kill him, Joe. You made it easy, though. Say him fast, baby. Here it comes. Look out, Tony. Watch the old man. Uh, Give me that gun. Yeah. We keep shooting the wrong people around here. Sorry, Hellman. I bungled, huh? Yeah. Yeah, you bungled, Joe. How's the old guy, Novak? You should live so long, Hellman. He's dead. You're gonna need me soon, Hellman. Yeah, right now. Come on, Joe. Tag by headquarters, Novak. Sure. Well, it was fun while it lasted. Yeah. I'm sorry he jumped in front of me. He didn't have to do it. No, but you expected it. I suppose. I'm made to expect things, Patsy. Uh huh. Then you're not going to mind this. <laughs> I expected that too. You can slap me, but don't leave me, Patsy. I don't want to be alone. You got a cigarette? They're on the table. Match, Patsy. You go build your own fire. I'm leaving. Please, Patsy. I don't want to be alone. You won't. I'll send you a whistle. Goodbye. Sweet double cross right from the start. Frank pitched the first curve. He stole the pictures from Condano's office the day of the payoff. He was going to wait for the dough from his sister and skip. In the meantime, the old man found out about it, killed the son, and left him in the hotel after Condano's boys had cleared out. Oh, it would have worked out all right, but Doreen found the pictures in the old man's room and guessed what happened. She gave him back to Condano and then made a deal with him to put a squeeze on the old man. And then she double-crossed Condano by tipping off the old man that Condano was on his way up. I guess he figured the girl for a fast play and sent a pal instead. The old man didn't know the difference. He really thought he killed Condano. And then the girl wrapped it up by sending his gun to headquarters. Well... Things had gone right, she'd have been right in the middle of that gravy boat. Her brother and Condana would be dead. Her father would be up on a murder rap. 
Once it started to unravel, it moved real fast. The first tip-off I got was when she offered the dough for her brother's killer. She'd have all that dough, and on the book she'd look like a field of Vermont snow. Uh, she was feeling around between somebody's shoulder blades, and from then on, all the cards fell just right. Condona was probably right. If they're not in the cemetery, watch out. Well, Hellman had only one question. Why would a guy want to kill off a dame like that? After I saw the pictures, I wondered myself. The Armed Forces Radio Service has just brought you Pat Novak for Hire, starring Jack Webb. Pat Novak is produced by William P. Russo. Jocko Madigan is played by Tudor Owen. Inspector Hellman is played by Raymond Burr. Music was composed and conducted by Basil Adlam. Be with us again next week when over most of these same stations we'll bring you Pat Novak for Hire. see why this is so popular with the armed forces. Um, I have to admit, what we just heard there with that slap, um, I don't think I've heard, I've heard before in radio. Um, slapping a, wo um, a woman. Uh, I can't say a lady because she didn't, uh, I wouldn't say that she acted like one. Um, but uh, you kind of get a sense uh, that might, uh, of Pat Novak's uh, basic uh, moral code. It, it's not very complex, and there's not a whole lot in it, apparently, but uh, there are some lines that you just don't cross, and uh, I, I think that came out there. I, 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 li I, I like the, uh, the uh, Jocko Madigan scene, where basically he uh, explained the writer's strategy for his existence. I'm your conscience. Uh, it was somewhat surreal in that sense, um, you ha where you had a character sitting there explaining his role in the plot. Um, but uh, it, it was nice to see him somewhat contradicted. Uh, the lines here are just classic. I've met better people in the sewer. Um, I I, th I thought we're we're very Chris. I, I did find that part where he got an apology uh, from the gangster for being pistol whipped, and he was like, "Hey, I said I was sorry. Can't you just you know move on?" Oh goodness, that's just like now nah, you you don't usually just get off with a pistol whip that. Uh, that easily. But uh, a very, very well-constructed story here. I actually appreciated listening to this the second time around, uh, the, as opposed to last time when I'd, li when I'd listened to 15 in a row. And this was just uh, number seven out of, uh, uh, out of 20. Um, so I'd heard the same thing. This one, I, because I've, I'd waited a little bit to listen to this one, uh, since I listened to uh, the sixth episode, I really, really, uh, you, you just hear the Christmas, cr Chris, you hear the crispness of the writing, um, and the, the dialogue just fantastic, so... 
From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, uh, getting ready to bring you another episode of Let George Do It. Um, you know, I've, it's actually, even though it's only been one week since the last Let George Do It po- uh, podcast you've heard, it's been a while since I listened to the show. Um, I, I probably at this point have talked about how I don't like getting too far ahead, and when you're about six weeks ahead of uh, production, uh, it's kind of time to slow down because you may make some decisions to change the way you do th- some things. Um, so you don't want to get too far ahead. Uh, well, during the hiatus, uh, I actually checked out some of the extras that uh, old time radio researchers. Um, offers on uh, Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Um, Now, Old Time Radio Researchers Group has come up with a lot of accurate and complete sets of radio shows. They're not necessarily all um, perfect, but they're some of the better ones that we have out there. Um, But the actual episodes aren't the only highlight. One thing they've got is kind of nice. They've got extras. Um, and I uh, was looking over the Yours Truly uh, Johnny Dollar, and they actually had an uh, had an interview um, with Bob De- Bailey's uh, daughter. I uh, and, and the one thing I, I found out that I didn't know is there was actually a proposal to do a Yours Tr- a uh, Let George Do It TV show. Uh, the problem uh, basically was that uh, 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 Bob Bailey was not how they pictured uh, George Valentine from the radio show. Bailey was five foot nine, 150 pounds. I have to admit, I'm kind of amazed that they could not find a place for him on television. I think Bogart was as short as that, if not a little bit shorter. Um, in fact, I think Bogart, they, they had a couple of his pictures where he had to wear elevated shoes. But for some reason, when it came to television back in the 1950s, 5'9 just was, wasn't going to cut it. So there wasn't a, a, a Let George Do It television show. Um, I guess that was what made radio great, uh, is if you had the good voice, uh, it didn't matter um, it didn't matter how you looked. You didn't necessarily have to be uh, telegenic. So in that way, it was a little less. Uh, it was a little less uh, superficial uh, than uh, television. I don't think Bob Bailey, uh, when he was on the radio, ever spent any time in front of the makeup counter. All right. Well, we're going to get into today's episode. Uh, before we do, I want to encourage you to check out Netflix. You know, there are a lot of uh, great films. We allude to them. Uh, occasionally, we'll show a special like we did at the uh, st- at the start of the series with uh, Call Northside 777. Uh, and the, the best source uh, for vintage films, uh, in a way where if you don't want to become a collector, you just want to view them, uh, check out Netflix, netflix.greatdetectives.net. And you can... Uh, you can watch great films like the like the Big Sleep, uh, Maltese Falcon, and uh, Murder My Sweet. Some of the classics uh, films of the 1940s and 50s available for renting and or instant watch over at Netflix, and at a reasonable low price that'll fit your entertainment budget. And so you're end up paying um, less than half a DVD for a month subscription. Uh, so check it out. Go to netflix.greatdetectives.net, two-week free trial. Uh, but without any further ado, let's get into today's episode of Let George Do It. I will apologize in advance for two things. One is there are a couple skips in the audio. Uh, could not be helped. I searched around the Internet. I tried three different versions of this file. Uh, and each version I found kind of had the same problem. So apologies for that. And I didn't... Um, I didn't edit out the last commercial in this case because I actually thought uh, you'd find it kind of amusing. So let's go ahead and listen, then we'll come back. Standard of California, on behalf of Standard Stations and independent Chevron gas stations throughout the West... 
invite you to Let George Do It. Another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice. Danger is my stock and trade. If you have something that must be handled with complete confidence, then you need me, George Valentine. Write full details. Dear Mr. Valentine, hatred between brothers is an old and tragic story. More tragic in my case because in all the years we haven't seen each other, my brother Phil hasn't been exactly a model of virtue. I feel I'm at least partially responsible and I'd like to make it up to him somehow. I think I finally see him. I finally succeeded in locating him, but at this point I need your help. You can reach me at the Hotel Stapleton. And it's signed, Sincerely Yours, Martin Bettner. Hmm. Gosh, I think in a way this is, well, touching. One brother realizing his error and kind Oh, Brooksy, of... you're a dyed-in-the-wool sentimentalist. I bet you still have your first doll and your first dance program stashed away somewhere. Yes, along with some other sentimental relics I've collected since I met you. Oh? A blackjack, an old and faded poison pen letter, one sawed-off <laughs> touché, shotgun... Touché, Angel, touché. <laughs> now, what do you say we call this Mr. Bettner at the Stapleton and see just what he has on his mind? I called you in, Mr. Valentine, because, well, in a way, you're my neighbor. Uh, what do you mean by that, Mr. Bettner? Well, look here, uh, Mr. Valentine, Miss Brooks. Yes? Uh, here in the personal notice column in the paper, your ad is just under mine. Oh, yes, now I remember your ad. You've been running this for a week or so. That's right, Miss Brooks. Oh, I just didn't tie it up with your letter. Oh, uh, let me see that. Uh, Philip, let's forget the past. If you'll meet me halfway, we can make up for all that bitterness. Uh, there's even a place waiting for you in the family business. I'm at the stable in Martin Bettner. You said you'd located your brother, Mr. Bettner. He must have gotten in touch with you. I said I think I've located my brother. But if Phil has seen my ad, uh, he hasn't answered it. I got only one reply from a uh, Renee Clemens. Uh, take a look at it, Mr. Valentine. Uh-huh. What does it say, George? Uh-huh. Well, it seems Miss Clemens knows where Phil Bettner, quote, the rat, unquote, is now holed up. She's willing to part with that information for a price figured it arrived at. Well, what's the problem, Bettner? Well, back in Waynesville, I know my way around, but here in this town, like a fish owner. Back home, I've got my own hardware business. I know everybody to look at, and they know me, but here it's different. Oh, I see. Well, why don't you just drive the best bargain you can with this gal, pay her off with a dated check, then see if her information is the real thing. Oh, it, it isn't just the money. I don't know the kind of people Phil's been associating with in the last five years. This could be some kind of trap. Feel an awful lot better if you came along with me to see this, Miss Clemens. All right, good enough. But look, Bettner, you've been hinting that your brother has been operating a little on the uh, shady side. Well, I'm afraid so. Well, then the police could tell you where he was, just like that, if you got in touch with them. I checked. Phil has no police record, thank heavens. He's been mixed up in gambling, mostly horse racing, and so far he's been lucky. Two weeks ago, some people in Detroit told me he left for here, and that's all I know. Well, assuming Miss Clemens is a local girl, your brother must have worked pretty fast to make such a, an indelible impression in two weeks. I don't know what to think. But I've got to find Phil and talk to him. Well, first, let's have a talk with Renee. She may know whereof she speaks, but I'm afraid her price won't be reasonable. It'll cost you 500 bucks. Now, wait a minute, sister. The name is Miss Clemens. And I should up the price, seeing that all of a sudden I'm dealing with three people. Uh, please, Miss Clemens, I asked Miss Brooks, Mr. Valentine, to come along with me. Five hundred bucks. But Mr. Bettner only wants his brother's address. He doesn't want to make a down payment on the house. Oh, I see we've got a Vassar girl here. All right, ladies, enough of this banter. The price is too high, Miss Clemens. Sorry. Come on, Bettner. Uh, yes, Let's get I... going. Oh, uh, no, uh, wait a minute. Well? What uh, kind of a deal would you go for? <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, I'll be lavish with Mr. Bettner's money. Two fifty cash. I have that much right here with me. What do you say? Well, Miss Brooks still doesn't seem to approve of the price. <laughs> All I can say is you're lucky you're dealing with men. Yeah, some girls are lucky to have what it takes to get what they want. All you've got is an address, and it's not even your own. Listen here, you Break little... clean, girls. Two hundred and fifty dollars, Miss Clemens. All right. Let's have it. Certainly. Here you are. Now, where can I find my brother? It's 356 Morano Street. 
A grimy, broken-down rooming house. It's so dark you need a seeing-eyed dog to get up the stairs. I got you. Just a cottage small by a waterfall. Thanks. We'll find our way. Just be sure you tell him Rene sent you. <laughs> I wish I could be there to see the look on his face. Well, if you know Philip is so dead set against getting in touch with me, why are you doing this? Mm, let's be charitable and say I wouldn't mind if he dropped dead. And it'd be a pleasure to spend the 250 bucks on flowers for his funeral. Oh, I knew she had a kind heart. Well, we may as well be going, Valentine. I know if I can just speak to Phil, everything will be all right. Yeah, 356 Reno Street, eh, Miss Clemens? You heard me. That better be Phil Bettner's place. Or you'll find his brother is just an Indian giver. Get what I mean? This is it. Number seven. He's got his card tacked up on the door. Hmm. Philip Bettner. Investments. Huh. Who's kidding whom? Well, this is worse than I thought. Well, looks like nobody's home. We'll wait right here till he comes back. I don't think that'll be very comfortable. Uh, do you mind paying for a lot, Bettner? What? What do you mean, George? Just this. Wait a minute. Please sit down. Oh, golly, where's the window? This place hasn't been aired out in a week. <laughs> the eternal feminine. I I don't know what I'll say to Philip. I don't want to hurt his pride. Uh-huh. What have you got there, Valentine? Well, it looks like this desk is your brother's investment office. His favorite and only investment being horses. I knew it was something like that. What's up, darling? December 20th, $2,000. Henning. January 3rd, $3,500. Henning, et cetera, et cetera. And all to Henning. What's that supposed to mean? No wonder your brother Phil is living in a dump like this. From the way this stacks up, he owes about 25 grand to Lou Henning. Oh, George. Wait a minute, Angel. You see, Bettner, this character Lou Henning is the big shot bookie in this town. You don't go around owing him 25,000 bucks for too long. Oh. George, please. I was just trying to explain to Bettner. What's the matter with you, Brooksy? That. that red spot under the closet door. Hey, wait a minute. What's the matter? What's wrong? It's all dried up. Blood, George? It's not red ink. What do you think that could be? Henning has his own way of collecting debts. Well, there's one sure way to find out. <coughs> yeah. That's not Phil. Who is it? This, my friend, is Lou Henning. Just about as dead as you can get with a knife stuck in your back. Phil wouldn't do a thing like this. He might have been a lot of things, but he's not a killer. I wouldn't know, Brooksy. Yes, George. There's no phone here. Beat it down the corner and call Lieutenant Johnson. Oh, I won't mind getting out of here at all. Valentine, couldn't we close that closet door? Sorry. From now on, we can't touch anything. Oh. I, uh... I suppose the police will just take it for granted that Phil did this killing. What would you think in their place? I guess you're right. Now, but... look, Bradner, I'm not saying your brother did this. But as soon as Henning's mob finds out what's happened, they're going to jump to their own conclusions. What I'm trying to say is, let's hope the police find him first. I see. Uh, Valentine, yeah? You're still working for me, aren't you? I was, but things are a little different now. No, they aren't. You You still have to find my oh, brother. Hold on, wait a find minute. Find him before he's shot down in cold blood. With the police, at least he'll have a chance to explain all this, if there is an explanation. You're putting me on a tight rope, Bettner. The police on one side, Henning's boys on the other. If it's a question of money, whatever you say... Looks like Henning's been in that closet a couple of days. It's not going to be easy picking up your brother's trail. I'm not asking you to promise me anything, but but try, will you? Okay. Okay, it's a deal. But if Henning's mob gets to Phil first, that Clemens dame will be spending that 250 on flowers for your brother's funeral. We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about gears. Most folks just couldn't say whether the gears in their cars are spur, worm, spiral, or hypoid, but... The men at Standard Stations and at independent Chevron gas stations know the minute you drive in. And because there are so many different kinds of gears in today's cars, all these service stations carry a variety of lubricants to meet their special needs. RPM lubricants. 
each one tailor-made to carry away heat, to keep gears shifting easily, to do a better wear-saving job. Make sure you get an RPM lubricant next time you get that 5,000-mile change for your transmission and differential gears. While you're at the independent Chevron gas station or standard station, ask for a free copy of Batter Up, the new illustrated handbook on baseball. It's a gift to you from the service stations that say and mean we'll take better care of your car. And now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. Am I my brother's keeper? Martin Bettner thought so, and hired George to help him locate his black sheep brother, Philip. But when they arrived in Phil Bettner's room, they found a body in the closet. The body of Lou Henning, a big shot bookie. George has just sent Claire to the corner drugstore to call Lieutenant Johnson. Be reasonable, Bettner. I promised you I'd look for your brother, but I can't leave until Lieutenant Johnson gets here. He's going to have an awful lot of questions to ask. But Phil won't have a chance if Lou Henning's men get to him first. You said so yourself. I know, I know. All right, there's one thing I will do, though. Make a phone call. I think I know just the character who might be able to give me a lead on Phil. I'll be back in a few minutes. Oh, uh, say, I, I just remembered. I think I saw a phone down in the hall when we came in. You could have thought of that before. <laughs> I wouldn't be calling you, Aunt Vos, if I wasn't willing to pay for the information. Yeah, the name's Bettner, Phil Bettner. Doesn't mean anything to you, huh? Now, look, Aunt Vos, you're my favorite pawnbroker. You know everything that goes on in this part of town. He's probably hiding out. Okay, I'll drop around your place in an hour or so. Hey, what goes here? Hey, better open the door so we can have some light out here in the hall, will you? Come on, before I break my neck. Hold up. Hold up. Hey, wait a minute. I... Now you stay right there by the head of the stairs, George, till I put on this light. Never mind that angel. Open the door. George! Uh, Mr. Bettner, he's... Yeah. Looks like he got the same treatment I did. Hey, see how he is, will you, Brooksy? I couldn't bend down now to pick up a thousand dollar bill. Mr. Bettner! Mr. Bettner, are you all right? Oh. Good. At least he's making a noise. George, he was knocked out, too. Uh, it, it was Phil. I, I was standing there and he... He came in the door and then... Let me help you get up, Mr. Bettner. Yeah, yeah. Wait a minute. Are you sure it was Phil? I I tried to talk to him, but he picked up that desk lamp and hit me with it. You better sit down. Thank you. Your brother. So that's the one who threw me down the stairs. Why did he come back? What was he looking for? Valentine, at least we know that Phil can't be very far from here. That should help you find him. I mean, you're still interested in finding that brother of yours? He didn't know what he was doing. He didn't even give me a chance to talk to him. You stay here in the hall, Hennessy. Okay, Lieutenant. Hey, what is this? The St. James Infirmary? Oh, Lieutenant Johnson. Yeah, I get your point, Lieutenant. Bettany here and I took a little of the worse for the wear. But we managed to outlive the corpse. Where is it, Valentine? Over there. Yeah, what do you know? It is Henny. Let you in on a little secret, Miss Brooks. I didn't believe you when you called me. Why do you think I kept screaming at you over the phone? Ah. Uh, oh, Hennessy. Yeah, Lieutenant. Get the fingerprint boys and the photographer and we'll go to work. Yes, sir. Still can't believe it. Believe what? Lou Henning with his $25 silk shirts and look at him. Folded up like a jackknife in the bottom of a closet in a crummy rooming house and killed by a cheap little gambler. Oh, Lieutenant, I don't think you heard. This is Philip Bettner's brother, Martin. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, that's all right. Lieutenant, I, I know there's only one thing you can think, but I still insist my brother didn't kill this man. Look, I may as well tell you, Mr. Bettner, we've got a general alarm out for your brother. Yes? 
I suppose, as usual, Mr. Valentine, you've got an altogether different theory about this thing. On the contrary, Lieutenant. I'm in complete agreement with you for once. Well, we dropped Bettner off safely at the Stapleton, and I bought you a nice, juicy hamburger. So now, out you go, Brooksy. You know what you're supposed to do. Yes, George. But you don't know what you're asking of me. Rene brings out the fishwife in me. The Black Mariah will be taking us both away. Go on, now, Angel. That gal in there didn't tell us half what she really knows. Maybe because you do rub her the wrong way, we can find out some more. Well, Okay. And when you're through, wait for me in the lobby of the stable. Mm-hmm. If I don't get there, I'll give you a call. Mm-hmm. He's so good to me. Well, now for Rene. Wish I'd let my fingernails grow. Uh, yes, miss? What? But... Well, well. Now all you have to do is whistle. Yeah? And I'll send you my grandfather's OU kid button. Huh? Oh, never mind, Bogart. Get on your switchboard and call Miss Clemens. Tell her I'm coming up to see her. Sorry, miss. She just left. Um, I'll be leaving in an hour myself. Does that uh, mean anything to you? Listen, Junior. Did Miss Clemens say where she was going and was there anybody with her? Sorry, I don't know a thing about the affairs of our tenants. Oh, I get it. Oh, now, a bright, good-looking boy like you must notice everything. I could tell that the way you looked at me as soon as I came in. Well, knowing yourself as you do, can you blame me? Oh, if you keep saying those things, you're going to spoil me, sure thing. (laughs) Uh, The name's Tommy. Yes, Thomas. Now, about Miss Lemon. Uh, She left about five minutes before you came in. She had a couple of bags with her. She was with a big, tall guy. Yes, Tommy? He had kind of wavy hair, and uh, I, I think she called him Phil. Huh? Oh, that's fine, Tommy. That's just what I wanted to know. How can I ever thank you? Oh, I told you I'd be off in an hour. Uh, uh, say, uh, wait, uh, what was your name again? I'll mail it to you on your 21st birthday. And that's a promise, Tommy. <laughs> Now, look, Oddfoss, why are you making like a clam all of a sudden? <laughs> Is that what I was doing? Oh, don't give me that. You've been selling information about people for years. Why the sudden... Oh, I get it. You already know about Lou Henning. So, uh, who doesn't? Now, look, Valentine. Why don't you forget you ever heard of Phil Bettner? If I'm afraid to talk to you, who will? <laughs> Side pocket, three ball. Uh, sorry to interrupt your pool game, friend, but Whitey Sanderson said you might know where I might find Phil. Look, brother, you're a stranger to me. Let's keep it that way. Okay, boys, here's the last race. Hialeah. Queen Meg. Win, 880, place 663, 40 for show. Say, mister, hey, tell me you're looking for information. Who told you? Oh, word gets around. It's about PB, ain't it? Yeah, that's right. Got anything I can use? If you're willing to pay for it. What do you say they step up out here? All right, come on, give. You know, you took the words right out of my mouth, mister. Okay, okay. Okay, mister. Here's five tens. And don't try chiseling for more because it won't work. I wouldn't do this to my best friend. Except I had a bad day at the track. Never mind that. Now, where do I find Phil Bettner? Twenty-two and a half Jackson, please. Okay, Valentine. I got your call. Where's Phil Bettner? Uh, mm. Yeah, Lieutenant, that's your boy. What's left of him? So Henning's mob did catch up with him first. That's about as neat a job as I've ever seen. Yeah. It's been right cozy sitting here waiting for you. I know. You lead an awful tough life, Valentine. Look, we're going to get him down to the morgue. You get his brother down there to identify him. Yeah, I'll do that. You don't mind if I make a telephone call first. What for? I promised Brooksy faithfully I wouldn't leave her sitting in that lobby all night. Brooks, 
Lucy. So that just about washes it up. Then I suppose what I wanted to tell you isn't too important now. Renee left her apartment with Phil a few hours ago. Yeah, yeah, but look, Angel, tell Martin Bettner to meet me at headquarters. He has to identify his brother. But don't tell him why. I'll take care of that myself. But sorry, George, you're going to have to call him yourself. Huh? I just saw something walk across the lobby, and I'm going to follow what it. What are you talking about? Tell you about it later, Angel. I'll be seeing you. <laughs> Going somewhere, Miss Clemens? Oh, the Vassar girl again. Yeah. Now, look, dearie, how about you and me going to the morgue together? What are you talking about? Oh, they'll probably want to ask you some questions about Phil. And I'd hate to see you take this bus and have to come all the way back. I'm taking this bus. You're just making things very difficult. And what are you going to do about it? Oh, I'm just going to tear your hair out and scream all over the place. Then they'll slap us both in jail for disorderly conduct. And the jail is right next door to the morgue. You wouldn't dare. Oh, no. Ah! Stop it. Hmm? Okay, you win. I knew you'd be reasonable. Where's that client of yours anyway, Valentine? Please, Lieutenant, be compassionate. Yeah. I just told Bettner his brother's lying here in the morgue. He's having a cup of black coffee. He'll be here in a minute. Oh. Uh, Swanson. Yes, Lieutenant? Got the tag on Bettner all filled out? Just got through making it out. Bettner, Philip, age 36, Caucasian, height 6 foot 2, weight 190, identifying marks, if any... Right arm withered, appendicitis scar, port wine bookmark of the left knee. Okay, I'll take your word for it. Where have you got him? Down the aisle there, number 302. Mm. When you get through identifying him, let me know and I'll put him away. Come on, Valentine. Hmm? Oh, sure, sure, Lieutenant. Now, don't tell me this place is getting you down. A tough-minded character like you. Oh, no, no, I was just thinking. Ah, let's see, 302... Right down there, sir. I think they're waiting for you now. Hmm? Thank you. Oh, there's Bettner now. Yeah. Are you okay now? Yes, I I think so. Could we make this as quick as possible? I know, I know, of course. Just necessary routine. Here. Is this your brother? Yes, that's Phil. Well, that's all there is to it, Mr. Bettner. We'll just put the sheet back over Lieutenant Johnson, he's down there, mister. Oh, Could I miss stop him. this way, Miss Clemens? Now what gives? Yeah, what is it, Brooksy? Look who I found, George. Well, we meet again, Miss Clemens. So that's what you saw walking across the lobby. Who is this? She's the young lady who gave us the information about my brother. Oh. Well, you might as well identify him, too, miss. Just for the record. Oh, oh Phil. Phil. I guess that clinches it. <gasps> I tried to tell him he wouldn't have a chance against Henning, but he wouldn't listen to me. How am I going to go on without him? I can't. Isn't this a sudden reversal, Miss Clemens? Not long ago, you were willing to sell him out to his brother for $250. Yes, and even spend that money on flowers for his funeral. What's that? I didn't know what I was saying. I was sore. I I guess I loved him too much. He said he was going to walk out on me. and uh, Well, that's why... I answered that ad of yours, Mr. Bettner. It doesn't really matter now, does it? Lieutenant Johnson, I suppose I can call down here and make all the necessary arrangements about the body. Just talk to Swanson, that's all. I'd like Phil to be buried in Waynesville in the family plot. Don't worry about a thing. You don't look too well. You better get back to your hotel, get some rest. I'll see you about the bill before I leave, Valentine. Oh, we won't have to wait for it that long. I got it for you right now. Hey, Ryan! Wait, 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 wait! What are you doing? Yes, I didn't make myself very clear. Oh, George! Oh, did you hurt what's him? What's the matter with you? Are you crazy? Come on, come on, get up, Bettner. Hey, what's the idea? Uh huh. A nice thirty-eight you're packing, Bub. Is this what you mean by the hardware business? Well, are you going to do some talking, or do I have to knock your ears off with this gun? Phil, don't let him. Shut up, you fool! Yes, baby. It is Phil. What's that? Then who's this guy on the slab? Martin Bettner, I think, huh, George? Right, Brooksy. Now, what do you got to say to that, Phil? Nothing. Okay, then I'll put the words in your mouth. You had a fight with Henning and you killed him. 
Who knew that between the post and Henning's boys, you were as good as dead? Oh, Phil. But you also knew your brother, Martin, was in town looking for you, the brother you always hated. So you got in touch with him, killed him in gangs to style in that room on Jackson Place. Then hired me for this fancy runner. You don't know what you're talking about. It's beginning to make sense to me. Go on, Valentine. You outsmarted yourself, Phil. You should never have put that light out and thrown me down those stairs. You see, that's something Martin couldn't have done in a million years. Why, well, well, you see for yourself, about... his right arm. We heard the report of Swanson. There was nothing wrong with Phil. But Martin Bettner had a withered arm. <laughs> I wonder, Brooksy, why is it that when brothers hate each other, it's worse than all the Hatfields and the McCoys locked in one closet? Didn't you suspect anything about Phil before Swanson read that tag at the morgue? Well, when that character in the book he joined sidled up, volunteering information, it was a little too good to be true. You mean Phil planted him there? Uh-huh. But, sweet face, blood is thicker than water. Brothers should love each other. Well, I, think... I thought it was pretty unfeminine for Renee to rat on Phil one moment, then leave with him the way Tommy told me she did. You didn't even listen to me, did you, when I was telling you about that on the phone? Well, uh, maybe with one ear. Then when I saw her in the lobby of the same hotel where Martin was staying, well, I had a hunch, too. Oh, of course, it wasn't one of those scientific hunches you get. Yeah, yeah. But about brothers, Brooksy, do you think it's familiarity that sometimes breeds such man? Oh, not necessarily. Now, look at husbands and wives. Huh? They go on for years and years living together. Well, they never think of murdering each other. <laughs> oh, Brooksy, you just haven't lived. And now, a message of importance to motorists. Can you imagine our friend George Valentine driving into a station and saying his car needed oil? Uh Uh-uh. You wouldn't catch George that way. He'd be sure to specify RPM motor oil, the great modern lubricant that's tailor-made to keep cars young. And if you consider your car an important investment, be sure you say RPM motor oil. RPM contains special compounds, and each added ingredient does a specific wear-saving job for your engine. It's a premium motor oil that stops rust, foaming, and corrosion, keeps your entire engine system cleaner. No wonder RPM motor oil is the two-to-one choice over any other motor oil in the West. Get it tomorrow at a standard station or an independent Chevron gas station where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll hear... George, do you think if Dr. Wormsley is right and he did see a man pushed off the roof, he'd be... Nothing like checking, Brooksy. No, wait a minute. The river's behind that high board fence and only windows from the elevator shafts on this side of the building. That would mean that... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Huh? Huh? George! That's a man. I mean, it was. Yeah. Past tense is putting it mildly. Well, Brooksy, it wasn't just Dr. Wormsley's imagination. And the odds are this is the body of our Mr. Dunlap. Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Ken Christie appears as Lieutenant Johnson. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Gloria Blondell, Carlton Cadell, Tyler McVeigh, Harry Bartell, Bill Bissell, and Stanley Waxman. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Welcome back. Could you imagine George Valentine pulling his car in um, and saying that he was out of oil? (laughs) That's got to be... Oh, 
Wow. Uh, apparently that's how they sold products back then. Huh, maybe I should try that. Could you imagine George Valentine buying a whole bunch of DVDs when he could just get Netflix? Uh, try Netflix.GreatDetectives.net. Now we'll find out on the next report how well that worked. Um, I, I like the... I like that this... One thing I like about this show, I, I thought that uh, Francine Robinson, who plays Gracie, um, just showed... Uh, I, 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 she showed more spunk this episode than I think she had throughout the whole series. Um, really, they, um, I, 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 lo I love that scene uh, where, she was, where she was taking on that, uh, that other woman. Uh, and again, we we get the unexpected uh, unexpected end where George Valentine just lowers the boom in a hurry, quite literally in this case. Um, so another uh, another episode with uh, some with a, a little uh, philosophical thought at the end, as well as a reminder to buy the right uh, brand of uh, gasoline because George Valentine would do it. You'd also subscribe to Netflix. Uh, just, add, no, just add that in. This is your host, Adam Graham, as we get set for our first ever one-hour episode. Uh, we won't do these all the time, but uh, this time I, I don't think anybody will mind. This is going to be a very special episode. Uh, so I, I hope you will, uh, you will stay tuned and will uh, enjoy this. We've got a little bit to introduce. Well, in our Sherlock Holmes, we'd gone through the Lewis Hector series, and uh, we made it through to 1936. Well, this this next performance was from 1938 uh, by an actor, a young actor you might have heard of by the name of Orson Welles. Um, and we have got a little bit to talk about here. The Mercury Theater on the Air was most famous for its performance of War of the Worlds, which was so realistic it, it kind of set off a national panic uh, and would later lead to uh, this becoming a sponsored performance. Uh, Mercury Theater was interesting because uh, each week would basically be a new performance by an ensemble cast featuring Orson Welles and they would do a variety of different pieces. Um, we're going to be taking a few trips back to the Merc uh, Mercury Theater um, with the various productions that Wells put together. Um, at the beginning of the, of the show, he comes out and delivers a stirring tribute to someone you've probably never heard of, William Gillette. Uh, who is William Gillette? Gillette may be as important as Sir Arthur Conan Doyle uh, in popularizing Sherlock Holmes. Um, basically, after um, killing off Holmes uh, in The Final Problem, uh, Doyle decided he wanted some money, and he had the idea we could write a play about Holmes, uh, you know, sell the play, and he had trouble coming up with a, a sellable uh, uh, play. Uh, so they ended up connecting with William Gillette, who wrote the play that, um, in many ways, really, um, um, really def defined Holmes on the stage. It was Gillette's phrasing that led to, for example, Elementary Mighty Watson. That wasn't actually in the original uh, novels. He introduced so many. Uh, so many different props, such as the violin, to Sherlock Holmes. It became a central part of the character. Then uh, Gillette uh, took uh, took Holmes on the road and traveled around the world, uh, performing as Sherlock Holmes. Um, going uh, and Gillette, by the way, was an American, um, performing in America, Aus Australia, England. Uh, the play spread worldwide. It, it wasn't always received well by critics, but in the era before movies, it really brought Sherlock Holmes for life, uh, to life. And he continued to play this part of Sherlock Holmes into uh, his early 80s. Um, there, 
Um, and he actually, uh, the, the version of Sherlock Holmes we played featuring Richard Gordon, um, he actually did the pilot episode as, uh, as Sherlock Holmes at the young age of 77. Uh, and then he uh, later performed as Sherlock Holmes on Lux, uh, uh, Lux Radio Theater, one of the early additions to come from New York when they were doing plays rather than movies. Well, not much of Gillette's performance. The whole thing does not survive. However, we've got a little bit of a clip, and we'll play that. This was the first um, major player of Sherlock Holmes, so we'll go ahead and play this for just a few seconds, and you'll hear some of these lines uttered in tonight's performance. I merely refer to this in case you should see fit at some future time to chronicle the most important and far-reaching piece of work in my entire career, the case of Professor Robert Moriarty. Moriarty? I don't remember ever having heard of that fellow. The Napoleon of crime. The Napoleon. Sitting motionless like an ugly, venomous spider in the center of his web. But that web having a thousand radiations and the spider knowing every quiver of every one of them. And within 48 hours, we'll have the lines drawn so tightly around him that he can't move. We'll arrest him and his entire gang. Oh, Holmes, this is a very dangerous thing. My dear fellow, it's perfectly delightful. My whole life is spent in a series of frantic endeavors to escape from the dreary commonplaces of existence. Wow, William Gillette, and you can barely tell from that that he um, was 83 years young uh, when recording that. Well, we've now introduced uh, the the focal point, the man who actually uh, wrote and adapted uh, Tanat's play. Then we have got the star, Orson Welles, um, who still remains a cultural icon uh, even after he's gone. Uh, in fact, I checked. Orson Welles has more than 25,000 fans on Facebook. Uh, he was an incredible actor, and, and I think, you know, numerous roles, famous for his role as, uh, as Charles Foster Kane in Citizen Kane. Uh, and, of course, Harry Lyme in The Third Man. Uh, I, I, of course, met him, uh, uh, Orson Welles, on screen when I was a kid in his... I'm sure equally famous role in the Muppet movie. And he's delivering his famous line, draw up the standard rich and famous contract. Well, that was my first memory. Um, but Wells, I think what he embodied, he had just this incredible audacity uh, to take on any part, any role, uh, any project, uh, particularly on the radio. Um and he was just absolutely uh, determined, uh, and uh, I, just by the, you know, and sometimes it didn't work out, but most, but most of the time he he had, had some amazing goal. So, all right, and we will hear from Wells again. And Wells, you know, it's unfortunate in one way that he became such a famous actor, because he could have been such a great. A uh, character actor. Um, he had this ability, and you're going to hear it tonight, to really um, do so many different characters uh, on the radio. It was uncanny. He's, you know, he could have been the male version of Virginia Gregg, but he had to go and get fame and fortune. Regardless, we're going to get our first taste of Orson Welles, and not our last on this on the great detectives of old time radio. Um, all right. Well, we are going to get into tonight's show, and I will caution going in. Uh, this is this is we're dealing with a 71 year old recording, uh, and as with the Holmes recordings for the previous weeks, it's not the best audio quality. But it. Um, Someone commented on a website, it kind of, even the defects kind of take you back. So just imagine you're um, in the 1930s, you're rolling, th um, you're rolling through kind of a rural area, and you turn on the radio uh, to the Columbia Broadcasting System, um, and you're kind of getting a little bit of skip, but you're ready to sit down and listen 
to the Mercury Theater on the Air presentation of The Immortal Sherlock Holmes. The Mercury Theater on the Air. <laughs> Columbia Broadcasting System takes pleasure in bringing you the 12th in a series of weekly broadcasts featuring Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the air. Tonight, Broadway's and radio's most celebrated theatrical producing company brings to life the best-loved character in detective fiction, the immortal Sherlock Holmes. The play is Orson Welles' own adaptation for radio of William Gillette's enduring melodrama based on the famous stories by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Before the performance begins... Here is the director of the Mercury Theatre, the star and producer of these unique broadcasts, Orson Welles. Good evening. Well, tonight it's back to Baker Street. Back to that unlikely London of the 19th century where high adventure awaits all who would seek it in a handsome cab or under a gas lamp in an Inverness cape. But tonight we pay tribute to the most wonderful member of that most wonderful world, a gentleman who never lived and who will never die. There are only a few of them, these permanent profiles, everlasting silhouettes on the edge of the world. There is first the little hunchback with a flat stick whose hooked nose is shaped like his cap. There is now and always will be the penguin-footed hobo in the derby and the baggy pants, and the small boy with a wooden head, and the long, rusty knight on horseback, and the fat knight who could only procure a charge on foot. There is also the tall gentleman with the hawk's face, and the underslung pipe, and the fore and aft cap. We'd know them anywhere and call them easily by name. Punch and the Charlies, Chaplin and McCarthy, Keelty, Sir John, and Sherlock Holmes. Now, irrelevant as this may seem, we of the Mercury Theatre are very much occupied these days with rehearsals for a revival of a fine old American farce. A lot of you will remember, if only for its lovely title, which is Too Much Johnson. Its author was William Gillette, which reminded us, as it reminds you, of Sherlock Holmes. As everybody knows, that celebrated American inventor of underacting lent his considerable gifts as a playwright the indestructible legend of the Conan Doyle detective, and produced the play which is as much a part of the Holmes literature as any of Sir Arthur's own romances, and as nobody will ever forget. He gave his face to him. For William Gillette was the aquiline and actual embodiment of Holmes himself. It is too little to say that William Gillette resembled Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes looks exactly like William Gillette. Sounds like him, too, we're afraid, and hope devoutly that the Mercury Theater and the radio will take none of the glamour from the beloved fable of Baker Street, from the pipe and the violin and the hideous purple dressing gown, from the needle and the cigar on the window ledge, and the dry, final, famous lines. Elementary, my dear Watson, elementary, the mere child's play of deduction. My name is Watson. I am a doctor. It was in the year 1880 that Holmes and I were introduced by our mutual acquaintance. At the time, we were both looking for a lodging that would suit our moderate means. This we found on the second floor of a house at 221B Baker Street. And it was during the years that we occupied these chambers together that Holmes established his unique international reputation as a consulting detective. During that time, I was privileged to be his daily companion, and I have done my modest share in giving to the world an account of some of his most famous cases. Most famous of these are the ones of which I have written under the names of the Speckled Band, Sinosaur, Hound of the Baskerville, and the Study in Scarlet. They represent, however, only a minute fraction of the 643 cases 
problem successfully solved during the years that we shared the lodgings in Baker Street. Other cases I hope one day to give to the world include the Tarleton murders, the sudden death of Cardinal Tuscan, the adventure of Ricoletti of the club foot and his abominable wife, the case of Mrs. Ferrantosh, the circus bell, and the case of the royal family of Scandinavia. Each illustrate in their own way the remarkable genius of my friend, Sherlock Holmes. Since my marriage three years ago, Holmes has continued to occupy the Baker Street lodgings by himself. And here almost every afternoon when my work in the office is finished, I'm in the habit of calling on him. The sitting room as you go in is exactly as it has been for the past 13 years. The worn, bearskin rug, the huge sofa covered with faded chintz, the mantelpiece cluttered with miscellaneous objects, unanswered letters and piles of loose tobacco. On one side of the fireplace, in a deep armchair, his pipe curling forth slow wreaths of acrid tobacco, draped in his hideous purple dressing gown, sits Sherlock Holmes with his violin under his chin. Come in. Oh, what, my dear How are you, Holmes? I'm delighted to see you. Perfectly delighted. Upon my word, I am, but... Uh... I'm sorry to observe that your wife has left you. <laughs> she has gone on a little visit. But how did you know? How did I when I like that? How do I know anything? How do I know you've been getting yourself very wet lately, that you're an extremely careless servant girl, and you've moved your dressing table to the other side of the room? Holmes, if you had lived a few centuries ago, they'd have burned you alive. Hmm. Such a conflagration would have saved me a great deal of trouble and expense. Tell me now, how did you know all that? Oh, too simple to talk about. Scratches and clumsy cuts, my dear fellow. On the inner side of your shoe there, just where the firelight strikes it. Scratches, cuts. Somebody scraped away crusted mud and did it badly, badly. Scraped the shoe along with it. There's your wet foot, my dear Watson, and your careless servant girl all on one shoe. Face badly shaved on the right side, always used to be on the left. Light must come from the other side. Couldn't very well move your window, must move the dressing table. <laughs> of course. But how the deuce did you know my wife was away? Well, where the deuce is your second waistcoat button, Watson? And what the deuce is yesterday's button here doing in today's apparel? And why the deuce do you wear the expression of it? Oh, <laughs> marvelous. Elementary, my dear fellow, elementary. The child's play of deduction. I'm only doing it for your amusement before we pass on to more serious matters. Oh, what is it now, Holmes? Watson, my dear fellow, the enthusiasm which has prompted you to chronicle, and if you would excuse my saying so, somewhat to embellish my little uh, adventures... You occasionally seem fit to introduce a certain element of romance, which struck me as being uh, just a trifle out of place. Something like working an elopement into the fifth proposition of Euclid. I uh, merely refer to this in case you should see fit at some future time to uh, chronicle the case on which I am about to embark. The strange case of Professor Robert Moriarty. Moriarty? I don't remember ever having heard of the fellow. No, Watson, you haven't. It's precisely this quality of invisibility that makes of Professor Moriarty the Napoleon of crime. Sitting motionless like an ugly, venomous spider in the center of his web. But that web having a thousand radiations and the spider knowing every quiver of every one of them. And within 48 hours, I'll have the lines drawn so tightly around him that he can't move. I'll arrest him and his entire gang. Oh, my Holmes, this is a very dangerous... My thing. dear sir, it's perfectly delightful. My whole life is spent in a series of frantic endeavors to escape from the dreary commonplaces of existence. For a brief period, I escape. You should congratulate me. The day before yesterday, I received in this room the visit of a certain foreign nobleman who has recently inherited a very considerable title and who is about to be married. It seems that this titled gentleman was so indiscreet as to fall in love with a young English lady by the name of Faulkner, uh, socially inferior, and to make her a promise of marriage. Uh, later, at his family's insistence, the thing was broken off, and the young lady died shortly after with a broken heart, leaving behind a sister. Also, considerable evidence in the form of letters, photographs, and jewelry with inscriptions. These the sister kept. These, together with the sister, are now being held in a house in, in John's Wood by a pair of blackmailers who go by the name of Chetwood. So far as you see, my dear Watson, a fairly ordinary case of blackmail hardly worth my attention. Last night... On my inspection, a certain element revealed itself which renders the case far more important than I had expected. And that element was Professor Moriarty. Come in. Beg pardon, Mr. Holmes. Mm, yes, Billy, what is it? Gentlemen, to see you by the name of Foreman. Come in, Billy. Come in. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Come in, Mr. Foreman. 
Good evening, Foreman. Good evening, Mr. Holmes. Uh, Watson, this is Inspector Foreman. The day before yesterday, he occupied the position of butler under the name of Judson in the home of Mr. and Mrs. Tetwood, uh, blackmailers of St. John's Wood. Well, Foreman, any news? Yes, sir. This morning, a little after nine, Tetwood and his wife drove away in a four-wheeler. They returned about eleven. Bassett was with them. You know him, sir. Mm, yes. When I last had the occasion to meet Mr. Bassett, he was about two years for safe-cracking. Go on, Foreman. Well, they took this man Bassett into the library. I got a look at him from the outside. And there he was opening up the safe where they'd been keeping the letters. Go on. In the end, when they got the safe open, it was empty. Hmm. The letters were gone. It seems like the Faulkner girl got them back somehow. I felt them pretty excited. Bassett went out to send a telegram. Have you got a copy of it? Yes, yes. Here it is, sir. It's in code. Hmm. Moriarty. I thought so, Watson. This case is taking a most promising turn. Foreman, you return at once to the house at St. John's Wood. In ten minutes, I shall be there myself. If I remember correctly, the kitchen is immediately below the drawing room. Yes. When I knock over a chair in the drawing room, you'll overturn a lamp in the kitchen, scatter smoke balls, and give an alarm of fire. All other instructions remain unchanged. Very good, sir. Hurry, Foreman. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Well, my dear Watson, it begins to look like a most interesting evening. My name is Sherlock Holmes. Whom, whom did you wish to see, Mr. Holmes? Oh, thank you so much, Mr. Chetwood. I had myself announced by the butler on my way up. Butler? I didn't. Oh, very well. Oh, here he is. Yes, Justin. Miss Faulkner begs Mr. Holmes to excuse her. She is not well enough to see anyone this evening. Uh, will you please hand this card to Miss Faulkner and say that I... I beg your pardon, Mr. Holmes, but it's quite useless, really. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear it. Yes, Miss Faulkner is, I regret to say, quite an invalid. She is unable to see anyone. Her health is so poor. Uh, has it ever occurred to you, Mr. Tedward, that she might be confined to the house too much? How does that concern you? It uh, doesn't. I simply make the suggestion. Might like to think it over. Your about this name? Judson, sir. Uh, very well, Judson. Go on, take my card up. Very good, sir. Well, this is really too good. Why, of course, you can take up your card or your note or whatever it is if you wish it so much. I was only trying to save you the trouble. Yeah, thanks. It's hardly any trouble at all, send up a card. You know, Mr. Holmes, you interest me very much. Oh, really? On my word, yes. We've all heard of your wonderful methods, the astonishing manner in which you gain information from the most trifling details. Now, I dare say, in this brief moment or two... You've discovered any number of things about me. Uh, nothing of consequence, Mr. Chetwood. I hardly more than ask myself why you were so distressed to see me at this particular moment and what there can possibly be about the safe in the lower part of that desk to cause you such painful anxiety. Yes, very good. Very good indeed. If those things were only true now, I'd be wonderfully impressed. It would be absolutely a me, sir. Uh, Justin, a message for you, Mr. Chetwood. You'll excuse me, I trust. It's from uh, Miss Faulkner. Well, really... She begs to be allowed to see you, Mr. Holmes. She absolutely implores it. Well, I suppose I shall have to give way. Judson, ask Miss Faulkner to come down to the drawing room. Say that Mr. Holmes is waiting to see her. Very good, sir. Quite remarkable upon my soul. May I ask, if it's not an impertinent question, what message you sent up that could so have aroused Miss Faulkner's desire to come down? Uh, merely if that she wasn't down here in five minutes, I'd go up. Oh, that was it. Yes, quite so. And unless I'm greatly mistaken, I hear the young lady on the stairs. In which case, she has a minute and a half to spare. Alice, uh, that is Miss Faulkner. Let me introduce Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Mr. Holmes. Ah, uh, Miss Faulkner. I'm really most charmed to meet you. Although it does look as if you've made me come down in spite of myself, doesn't it? I thank you very much indeed for consenting to see me, Miss Faulkner, but regret to observe that you were put to the trouble of making such a very rapid change of dress. Oh, yes. I did hurry a trifle, I confess. Mr. Holmes is quite living up to his reputation, isn't he, Freddie? Come in. Yes, ma'am. What are you doing here, Dodson? I beg pardon, ma'am. I was answering the bell. What bell? The drawing room bell, sir. 
What do you mean, you blockhead? No one rang the bell. I'm quite sure it was wrong, sir. Well, I tell you, it did not ring. Your uh, butler is right, Mr. Chetwood. The bell did ring. How do you know? I rang it. What do you want? I to send my card to the real Miss Faulkner. The real? I said the real Miss Faulkner. Captain. Yes, sir? Home. What right have you to ring for servants and give orders in my house? What right have you to prevent my cards from reaching their destination? How does it happen that you and this woman are resorting to trickery and deceit to prevent me from seeing Alice Faulkner? Through some trifling oversight, Judson, neither of the cards I handed to him has been delivered. Kindly see that this error does not occur again. My orders, sir. Ah, you have orders. I can't say, sir. You I... are told not to deliver my card. What business is it of yours, I'd like to know? I shall satisfy your curiosity on that point in a very short time, Mr. Chetwood. Yes. And you'll find out in a very short time that it isn't safe to meddle with me. It wouldn't be any trouble at all for me to throw you out into the street. Yeah, possibly not, but trouble would swiftly follow such an experiment on your part. It's a cursed lucky thing for you. I'm not armed. Yes, well, Miss Faulkner comes down, you go and arm yourself. Arm myself? I'll call the police. Well, tomorrow I'll do it now. Oh, no, you will not do it now. You will remain where you are until the lady I came here to see has entered this room. What makes you so sure of that? Because you will prefer to avoid an investigation of your suspicious conduct, Mr. James Larrabee. Larrabee? That I'm is not... the name under which you are known to Scotland Yard, I believe, Mr. Chetwood. This lady here is your wife. To you, Judson, you will either deliver that card to Miss Faulkner at once or sleep in the police station tonight. Matter of small consequence to me, which you do. Shall I? Shall I go, sir? Go on. Take up the card. It makes no difference to me. Uh, a short time since, Larrabee, you displayed an acute anxiety to leave the room. Pray do not let me detain you or your wife any longer. Take it you prefer to remain while I talk to Miss Faulkner? We do, Mr. Holmes. Ah, last, Miss Faulkner. Is it Mr. Holmes? Yes. You wish to see me? Very much indeed, Miss Faulkner, but I'm sorry to see that you are far from well. Oh, no, I... No? Beg your pardon. What does this mark mean? Oh, nothing. Nothing? No. And the mark here on your neck, plainly showing the clutch of a man's fingers, does that mean nothing also? It occurs to me that I should like to have an explanation of this. Possibly you can furnish one, Mr. Larrabee. How should I know? It seems to have occurred in your own house. What if it did? You'd better understand that it isn't healthy for you or anyone else to interfere with my business. Ah, that is your business. Hear that much, at least. Pray be seated, Miss Faulkner. I don't know who you are, Mr. Holmes, or why you are here. I shall be very glad indeed to explain. My business is this. I've been consulted as to the possibility of obtaining from you certain letters addressed to your sister, which are supposed to be in your possession. I cannot give up my sister's letters, Mr. Holmes. There are other things besides revenge. His punishment. Uh, believe me, Miss Faulkner. There is nothing more to say. Good night, Mr. Holmes. But my dear Miss Faulkner... Oh, I'm so sorry. How clumsy of me to turn over this chair. Well, well! Oh, what's that? What's that? What is this? What's going on in your house here? The lamp, sir. The lamp, sir. The lamp for the kitchen, sir. It fell off the table and everything down there is blazing, sir. Quick, sir. Come down. Come down. Come down. Come down. Don't alarm yourself, Miss Faulkner. There is no fire. No fire? The smoke was all uh, arranged for. Arranged for? What does it mean, Mr. Holmes? It means this, Miss Faulkner. It means that I wanted a package of letters, Miss Faulkner, and that by following your eyes just now, when you thought there was a fire, I discovered that you had hidden them in the upholstery of this chair. Hmm. Oh, yes. Quite elementary, as you see. And now that they're in my possession, there seems to be no reason for me to remain any longer in this house. Good night, Miss Faulkner. Miss Faulkner. Yes? I... I can't take them, Miss Faulkner. These letters belong to you. I find that I cannot keep them. Unless you can possibly change your mind and let me have them of your own free will. <laughs> I suppose you could. I will therefore return them to you and, uh... Oh, here's our friend, Mr. Ladder, there, returning from the fire. Oh, you've got the letters, have you? Now I suppose we're going to see you walk out of the house with them. On the contrary, you're going to see me return them to their rightful owner. Miss Faulkner, here are your letters. Should you ever change your mind and be so generous, so forgiving as to wish to return these letters to the one who wrote them, you have my address. In any event, rest assured, there will be no more cruelty, no more persecution in this house. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. You are perfectly safe with your property, Miss Faulkner. For I shall so arrange it that your faintest cry of distress will be heard. 
If that cry is heard, it will be very unfortunate for those who are responsible. As for you, Mr. Larrabee, and uh, you, madame, I beg you to understand that you continue your persecution of that young lady at your peril. Good night. Miss Faulkner, come here, Miss Faulkner. Now, are you going to give me those letters? No, never. Are you going to give me those letters? Oh. Now then. Yes, Jim. Now then, Miss Faulkner. Do you give me those letters or do I break your arm? <laughs> Come and knock on the door. No, it was on that side. Did you call, madam? I think someone knocked, Judson. I'll see, madam. I beg pardon, madam, but there's no one at the door. Very well, you may go. He's got us watched. What we want to do is to leave it alone. Let the Emperor have it. You mean Professor Moriarty? That's who I mean. Once let him get at it, he'll settle it with Holmes pretty quick. Don't you worry a minute. I tell you, Professor Moriarty will get at him before noon tomorrow night. He won't wait long either. And when he strikes, it means death. <laughs> I dined together at Scott's and Piccadilly Circus. After dinner, we went to a concert at Queen's Hall. I can still see him on this particular night of the Moriarty case, well knowing that his life was in peril, sitting beside me in the stalls, wrapped in the most perfect happiness, listening to Sarasati play the violin, gently waving his long, thin fingers in time to the music. <laughs> When it was 
was over, he rose, put on his long coat, and started with long steps in the direction of the street. Come, my dear Watson. Go on to Baker Street. I have an idea that very soon we shall be receiving a uh, most interesting visit. <laughs> From the Queen's Hall, we hailed a hansom, and as we came down Baker Street, we could see that the light was burning on the second floor of 221B. We went up the dark, narrow stairs. Mr. Holmes. The boy Billy was waiting for us. Mr. Yeah. Holmes. What is it? Mrs. Hudson's compliments, sir, and she wants to know if she can see you. Now, where is Mrs. Hudson? Downstairs in the kitchen, sir. Uh, my compliments, and I don't think she can. Where she is. She'll be very sorry, sir. Our regret will be mutual. It was most terribly important, sir, being as she wants to know what you'll have for breakfast in the morning. Uh, the same. Same as when, sir? Uh, this morning. But you didn't have nothing, sir. You wasn't here. I won't be here tomorrow. Yes, sir. Was that all, sir? Uh, quite so. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Oh, Mr. Holmes, here's a letter for you, sir, on the table. Delivered ten minutes ago. Mm, well, read it, Watson. That's a good fellow. I put on my dressing gown. Uh, dear sir. Uh, that's the dress's name. Why, uh, James Larrabee. And what did James to say this evening? Dear sir. I uh, hope he won't say that again. <laughs> I have the honor to inform you that Miss Faulkner has changed her mind regarding the letters, etc., which you wish to obtain, and has decided to dispose of them for a monetary consideration. Mm. If you wish to negotiate, will you be at nine o'clock at the guard's monument at the foot of Waterloo Place? You will see a four-wheeler with wooden shutters to the windows. If you have the cab followed or try any other underhand tricks, you won't get what you want. Let me know your decision. Yours truly, James Larrabee. Mm, mine truly. Well, wait up, perhaps. What does the fellow mean? Fellow means to sell me a base imitation for a large sum of money, certain letters he does not possess. I shall probably buy them from him. Now, if I have the points tonight, eleven o'clock, dark monument, cab with wooden shutters, no one to come with me, no one to follow, or I don't get what I want. Quite right. Ah. But uh, this cab with the wooden shutters. Oh, merely a little device to keep me from seeing where they're taking me. Billy. Yes, sir. Uh, give this to the man. Give the uh, woman, sir. Oh, a young or old? Look quite young, sir. And you're handsome. Four-wheeler, sir. Mm, have you seen the driver before? Yes, sir, but I can't think where. Uh, hand this to the lady, apologize for delay, and look at the driver again. Yes, sir. But, my dear Holmes, you didn't say you would go. But I certainly did. But this fellow means mischief. This fellow means the same. I beg pardon, sir. A message come over from the chemist on the corner to say a man has been hit by a bus. Looks like his leg broke. And would Dr. Watson kindly step over and help till the ambulance Oh, you certainly are going to watch. I'll be back in a minute, Holmes. Uh, delay. Yes, sir. Who brought that message? Boy from the chemist, sir. Oh, yes, of course. But which boy? Must have been a new one, sir. I ain't seen him before. Billy, get down, sir, quickly. Look after the doctor. The boy's gone. There's a man with him. It means mischief. Let me know. Don't stop it. Come up. Ring the doorbell. I'll hear it. Ring it loud. Yes, sir. Professor Moriarty, you'll be taken from here to the hospital if you keep your hand behind you like that. Oh, that's better. Hmm. In that case, please put your revolver on the table. You evidently don't know me. I think it's quite evident that I do. Uh, pray have a chair, Professor. I can spare you five minutes. Let's see what I say. Now, careful. What are you about to do, Professor Moriarty? Mm. Look at my watch. I'll tell you when your five minutes is up. It is your intention to pursue this case against me? Uh, that is my intention. To the very end. I regret this. 
Too much on my own account, but on yours. I share your regret, Professor, but solely because of the rather uncomfortable position it will cause you to occupy. May I inquire to what position you are pleased to use, Mr. Holmes? I refer to the position you will occupy at the end of a rope, Professor Moriarty. Have you the faintest idea that you'd be permitted to live to see that day? As to that, I do not particularly care, so that I bring you to see it. You never bring me to see it. You think that I would be here if I hadn't made the streets quite safe in every respect? I could never so grossly overestimate your courage as that, Professor Moriarty. You imagine that your friend the doctor and your boy Billy will soon return? What? So, it leaves us quite alone, doesn't it, sir? <laughs> quite alone. So that we can talk to that over quietly, Mr. Holmes, and not be disturbed. In the first place, I wish to call your attention to a few memoranda which I jotted down, and which you will find that... There they are. Look out! Don't do that! Hands down, quickly! Your father, away from that memorandum book you're talking about? I was merely about to take out a small notebook. Well, merely don't do it. I don't want it. I've got one of my own. If you want it, we'll have someone get it for you. I always like to save my guests unnecessary trouble. I observe that your boy doesn't answer the bell. Mm. No, but I have an idea that he will fall off. It may possibly be longer than you think, Mr. Holmes. What? That boy? Yes, that boy. Well, at least we'll try the bell once more, Professor. Doesn't it occur to you that he may possibly have been detained, Mr. Holmes? Yeah, it does, Professor. Uh, but it also occurs to me that you're in very much the same predicament, Professor Moriarty. I beg pardon, sir. Someone tried to hold me, sir. Yeah, it's quite evident, however, that he failed to do so. Yes, sir. He's got my coat, sir, but he ain't got me. Billy. Yes, sir. Billy, the gentleman I'm carefully pointing out to you with this forty-five desires to have us gather something of his left hand inside coat pocket. He's not feeling quite himself today, and the consequence of his trying to do it himself might prove fatal. I suggest you attend to it for him. Yes, sir. Is this it, sir? This gun? Uh, quite so. Okay, I'll put it on the table. Uh, not there, Billy. On this table. I can reach it. More like it. That's all, Billy. I see if he's got another, sir. Well, I believe, surprise me. Has the gentleman taken the trouble to inform us he hasn't? When, sir? When he made a snatch for this one. And now, Professor, now that we have your little memorandum book, do you think of anything else you'd like before Billy goes? Any little thing you've got that you don't want? So sorry. It's all, Billy. Thank you, sir. Listen, Holmes, to me. On the 4th of January, you crossed my path. On the 23rd, you incommoded me. And now, at the close of April, I find myself placed in such a position through your continual interference that I'm in positive danger of losing my liberty. Mm. Have you any suggestions to make? No, I have no suggestions to make. I have a fact to state. If you don't copy it at once, your life's not worth that. I'm afraid, Professor, that in the pleasure of this conversation, I'm neglecting more important business. You excuse me a moment while I get my pipe off the mantelpiece here. I came here this evening, Mr. Holmes, to see if peace could not be arranged between mm, us. Quite so, quite so. You've seen fit not only to reject my proposal, but to make insulting references coupled with threats of arrest. You've been warned of your danger. You don't heed that warning. Perhaps you'll heed this. Up on your hands, Mr. Holmes. Up the number right. Hmm. I didn't imagine I'd leave that gun loaded, did you, Professor Moyarty? Here are your cartridges. Well, I didn't suppose you'd want to use that gun again, so I took them out while you were talking and put them in my pocket. You'll find them all there, Professor. Billy! Yes, sir? Can you please show Professor Moyarty the door? Yes, sir. This way, sir. Don't ever say I didn't warn you, Mr. Holmes. Uh, no. No, Professor Moyarty. I never will. Billy, come here. Yes, sir. Billy? Billy, you're a good boy. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. You are 
listening to the Columbia Broadcasting System's presentation of Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air in Sherlock Holmes, with Orson Welles in the title role and Ray Collins as Dr. Watson. We pause a moment for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. We continue now with this CBS presentation of Sherlock Holmes, played by Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air. It was exactly nine o'clock when Sherlock Holmes left the house in Baker Street. He had given the strictest instructions that no one was to follow him. If there had been no word from him by noon of the following day, we must notify Scotland Yard. I went to the window and looked after him as he went down Baker Street. A tall, thin figure in a gray ulster, walking with long, smooth steps in the direction of Langham Place. There he entered a cab. Mr. Like magazine. That's what I'm doing. Chuck it. Why should I chuck it? There might be gas, you fool. There ain't no gas. It's been four days since we had gas in the room. Yeah, I still say there might be gas. Did you check it? Uh, I will. Here he goes. Ready? Give me a turn. <clears throat> yeah, that'll do. Turn it off. Five minutes of that. All your troubles are in. Here. What's that? Static. That's right, Kagan. Did you hear it? Yes, sir. Did I tell you? Yes, sir. Be careful now, your boy. You've got a tough one tonight. We said who, as I've heard. Sherlock Holmes. You mean that, sir? God's truth. He's going to count him out. Well, if you don't and he gets away, I'm sorry for you, that boy. The governor's here. Not the governor himself. Professor Moriarty. Shut up. Yes, sir. Got your full crew? All yes, sir. No mistakes tonight, Cragen. Well, I'll be careful of that, sir. This is Larrabee. Hello. He's in on this job. Hello, Larrabee. Oh. What's that door, Batty? A small cupboard, sir. No outlet? None whatever, sir. A window? Nailed down, sir. Man might break the glass. If he, if he did, he'd come up against a heavy iron bar that side. <laughs> we'll have him tied down before he can break any glass, sir. Uh, you've used it before, eh? Don't you know it's air tight? Every crevice is sealed, sir. When the men have turned the gas on him, they leave by this door? Yes, sir. We made quite secure. Every bolt on the outside, sir. Solid oak bars overall. You can see how quick you can operate them. Well, they tie a man down, sir. There's no need to hurry. Let me see how quick you can operate them. Really? Yes. Yeah. That's, that's good. Open it up. Now, Craig, in. the rest of you, one thing remember. Whatever happens, no shooting tonight. Not a single shot. Will be heard in the alley below. The first thing is to get his revolver away before he has a chance to use it. Two of you attract his attention in front. The other come up on him from behind and snatch it out of his pocket. Then you have him. Arrange that, Craig. Oh, I'll attend to it, sir. Mr. Larrabee, you understand? We wait for you. I understand, sir. I give you this opportunity to show him the packet of letters you forged and get what you can for your trouble. Two hundred pounds doesn't interest me, Mr. Larrabee. What I am, I'll tell you. Oh, I understand, sir. When you've finished and got your money, you whistle. And these gentlemen will come in. And carry it. You hear that, Cregan? That's right. And Cregan, at the proper moment, present my compliments to Mr. Sherlock Holmes and say that I wish him a pleasant journey to the other side. Go on, Bessie. Good night, gentlemen. Good night. Good night. Good night, sir. All right, boys. Clear. When you hear the whistle, in you come. Right you are, sir. Larry. Yes, sir. You get down on the corner below. Let me know when he comes. I will let you know. Well, when you see him driving up, come down the alley and whistle three times. Very good, sir. Here. What's this? Ah! How did you get it? 
What have you been doing since I came up here? Informing the police, perhaps? No. I was afraid he'd come, so I waited. To warn him, I suppose. No. To warn him, yes. You're going to swindle and deceive him, sell him a packet of false letters. I know that. What else are you going to do to him? Mm, wouldn't you like to know? Where are those men who came up here? What men? Three terrible-looking men. I saw them go into the street door. You don't mean these men, do you, Miss Walker? <laughs> Listen, there he is now. What? Oh, that's him. That's the signal. We won't have time to get her out. Shove her in there, in the cupboard. Yeah, that'll do. In with her. Into the cupboard. Hey, there is some watches in here. Come on, you're all right. Try something in there. Here, this knife. This will hurt. thought after all this driving about in the closed cab, you told me something new. I've well, seen it before, have you, Mr. Holmes? Oh, well, a time or two. Now to come to think of it, I nabbed a friend of yours in this place while he was trying to drop himself out of the window. Ed Colvin, the cracksman. Colvin, Colvin never heard of him before. Well, you certainly never heard of him after. Sure of that. Great McCarthy has used these luxurious chambers in the spring of 89. One of them hid in that cupboard. We pulled him out of the heels. Quite interesting. But times have changed since then. Uh, so they have, Mr. Larrabee, so they have. But then it was only cracksmen, and counterfeiters, pickpockets, and petty swindlers of various kinds. But now... Well, what now? Well, between you and me, Mr. Larrabee, we've heard some not altogether agreeable rumors. Rumors of some pretty shady work not far from here. Murder to a very peculiar kind. I've always had a suspicion. That's it. My surmise was correct. It is. This is what? This room is caught sealed. What does that signify to us? Nothing to us, Mr. Larrabee. Nothing to us. But it might signify a good deal to some poor devil who's been caught and gassed in this trap. Well, if it's nothing to us, suppose we leave it alone and get to business. My time is limited. Yeah, of course. I should have realized that these reflections could not possibly appeal to you. Well, have a cigar, Mr. Holmes. Oh, thanks. Yeah, good cigar, this, Mr. Larrabee. Genuine Havana. Glad you like it. Now, here is the little packet of letters which is the object of this meeting. I haven't opened it yet, but Miss Faulkner tells me everything is there. Uh, I suppose, Mr. Larrabee, that if Miss Faulkner knows nothing about this affair, we omit her name from the discussion. What do you mean? Who told you she doesn't know? You did. Every look, tone, gesture, everything you've said and done since I've been in this room has informed me that Miss Faulkner has never consented to this transaction. It is a little speculation of your own. Oh, I suppose you think you can read me like a book. Oh, no, no, like a simmer. Well... Let it pass. How much will you give? A thousand pounds. I couldn't take it. Uh, what do you ask? Five thousand. I couldn't give it. Well, I've been offered four thousand for this little Why packet. Why didn't you take it? Because I intended to get more. Oh, that's too bad. They offered four thousand. They'll give five. They won't give anything. Why not? They've turned the case over to me. Hmm. Would you give three thousand? Mr. Larrabee, strange as it may appear, my time is limited as well as yours. I have brought with me the sum of one thousand pounds, which is all that I wish to pay. If it is your desire to sell at this figure... Kindly surprise me of the fact at once. If not, permit me to wish you a very good evening. Well? You can have it. Too small a matter to haggle over. Give me the money. Yes, certainly. Ah. I thought you said you'd only brought just a thousand. I did. This is it. You brought a trifle more, I think. Uh, quite so. I didn't say I hadn't brought any more. Well, you can do your little fix when it comes to it, can't you? It depends on who I'm dealing with. Yeah. You give me that money. Come on, fix. Hand it over. Ah! Now, I've got you where I want you, James Larrabee. You've been so cunning and so cautious and so wise, we couldn't find a thing to hold you for, but this little slip will get you in for robbery. Well, you're hunting in, will you? What are your views about being able to get away from here yourself? I do not anticipate any particular difficulty. Yeah, robbery, eh? Why, even if you got away from here, you haven't got a witness. You haven't got a witness to your name. I'm not so sure of that, Mr. Larrabee. I'm so sure of that. You usually fasten this cupboard door with a knife. Pull away from that door. Stand back. 
Scoundrel, what does this mean? I'll tell you what it means. Stop it. Stop it. I'm afraid you're badly hurt, Miss Faulkner. Mr. Holmes, look back! Hey! Hey! What are you there, boy? I'll, uh, have to ask you gentlemen to wait just, just one moment, please. Here, there. What's the idea of sitting down and writing? What are you writing? Writing your will, I suppose. No, no, only uh, a brief description of one or two of your gentlemen. The police. I'm ready now. Wait a bit. You better listen to me, Mr. Holmes. We're going to tie you down nice and tight to the top of that table. Why, you surprised me, gentlemen. Thinking you're so sure of anybody in this room. And three bars gone out of that window. Bars or no bars, you're not going to get out of here as easy as you expect. There are so many ways, Mr. Larrabee, that I hardly know which one to choose. Well, you better choose quick, I can tell you that. I'll choose at once, Mr. Cregan. And my choice falls on this chair. Oh, my God! The light is in the way, Mr. Carroll! Look out! Hey, guys! Look at the star! Take him by the star! Look at the star! Look out! He's going through the window! He's up on the leg! He's right down! Look at him! He's out! He's quick! After him! There he goes! He's out! By the window! No, gentlemen, no. Not by the window. I'm leaving by the door. Uh, by the way. I left my cigar for you on the windowsill. Good evening, gentlemen. There was no news of Holmes that night. And Biddy reported next morning that he had not breakfasted at home. I had a busy morning at my office in Harley Street. It was after 11 before the last of my appointments was over. And still no news of Holmes. Did you uh, ring Dr. Watson? Oh, pardon. Is there anyone waiting? I have to be in Baker Street at noon. There's one person in the waiting room, Doctor, a lady, sir, and she wants to see you most particular. Hey, what about? She didn't say so, only she said it was the most important, sir, if you will see her. Oh, very well, I'll see her and call a cab for me at the same time and have it wait. Show the lady in. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, this way, ma'am. This way. Ah, oh, Doctor, it's awfully good of you to see me. I'm Mrs. H. DeWitt Seaton. Excuse me, I didn't bring my card case. Well, if I did, I'd lost it. Don't trouble about a card, they said you were Mr. Holmes's friend. Several people told me that, and several. They advised me to ask you where I could find him today, this morning. And everything depends on it, Doctor. Everything. I go to Mr. Holmes at once. But I've been. I've been, and he wasn't there. You went to Mr. Holmes' house? Yes, in Baker Street. That's why I came to you. They said he might be here. No, he isn't here. But don't you expect him this morning? No, there's no possibility of Mr. Holmes coming, as far as I know. But couldn't you get him to come? It would be such a great favor to me. I'm almost worn out with going about him with a dreadful anxiety. If you could get word to Mr. Holmes to come... I could not get him to come, madam, and I beg you to excuse me. I'm going out myself on urgent business. I have no idea where Mr. Holmes could be. I... What's that, Martin? It like a husband, sir. Probably nothing more than a broken-down hat. Uh, see what it is, Martin. Well, that's the bell, sir. Somebody's hurt, sir, and they're wanting you. Well, don't allow anybody to come in. I have no more time. Very well, sir. But they're coming in, Doctor. Let the old man come in. Come yes, yes, they're bringing in. There ain't nowhere else for him to go. Son of a doctor's on his business, and he can't come in when he's there. The doctors can't see anybody. He's got to come in. We can't see that in the street. Then All we'll right, go. help him in, Parker. Oh, doctor, it's frightful. Can I be of some use? Not whatever, not whatever. The doctor must see the poor fellow. Oh, my leg, my leg. Uh, right this way, sir. Uh, be careful of the suit, sir. Uh, uh, that's it. The accident. Oh. Come on, the old accident. Oh, you can't. That's plain enough. He was on the wrong side of the street, he was. And now, over to the street. No, no, I'll sit here. No, 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 this is the chair, sir. Uh, don't you suppose I know where I want to sit down? You'll sit down here. That isn't the doctor. Yeah, the doctor will have a look at you. He is the doctor. Uh, that isn't the doctor. Yes, it is a doctor. Here, doctor. You just come and have a look at this old bloke, will you? He's hurt himself a little, then. Uh, are you a cabman? Yes, I'm the cabman. Well, I'll have you arrested for this. Arrested? Arrested, arrested, arrested. You can't arrest me. No, I can't, but somebody else can. Where's my hat? Where's my hat? My hat! My hat! Never mind your hat. I will mind my hat. I'll hold you responsible. There's your hat in your hand. Go on, sit down. That isn't my hat. Here, you're responsible. I'll have you arrested. Here, come back. I'll go and stick around here. You know, I've got to go in the tent of the door. Bring your horse in here. I want to speak to him. I... Uh, let's see. I won't stay in this place. If I ever get out of here alive... What are you staring at me for? Martin, oh, tell that cab to wait for me. I must see if he's badly hurt. Uh, yes, sir. Now, my friend, if you'll sit quiet for one moment, I'll have a look at you. Well, stay still, will you? 
Well, how can I... Remarkable, remarkable weather we're having, eh, Doctor? Oh, what on earth? How about having me remove some of this ridiculous disguise, Watson? Holmes, is that you? Uh, quite so, my dear fellow, quite so. Holmes! Watson, Watson, can we get out that window? Look out, the blind! What do you want me to do? Nothing! Well, we've been done by Mrs. Larrabee here. Look out, Holmes! You can get out that way! I don't think so, Watson. Foreman! I'm not sir. Good work, Foreman. I take this lady in charge. Yes, sir. Very good, Foreman. Wait for me outside. Yes, sir. Ah, oh, Watson, my dear fellow, I regret to say that at the present time, Professor Moriarty himself has not risen to the base. Where do you think he is? In the open streets, under some clever disguise. Watching for a chance to get it. And this woman sent him here... Quite to... so, quite so. A spy. To let them know by some signal. If she found me in the house, now they know. Pull down that blind, Watson. I don't care to be shot at from the street. I imagine we shall hear from Professor Moriarty very soon now. Mr. Holmes, Mr. Holmes. What did I tell you? He's come, sir. From where? The house across the street. He was in there watching these windows. He must have seen something, for he's just come out. There was a cab waiting in front of this house, sir, and he's climbed up and changed places with the driver. Get out again quick, Billy, and keep your eye on him. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Watson, you let me have a rather heavy portmanteau for a few moments, sir. I won't do it any harm. Passes my large lad stone over there in the corner. Bring it here, please. Yes, sir. Here you are, sir. Here's a portmanteau. Uh, thank you, Parsons. Put it down there. Mm, thank you so much. Uh, Parsons, you ordered a cab to the doctor a short time ago. It's been waiting, I believe. Yes, sir, I think it has, sir. Be so good as to tell the driver to come in here and get a release. When he comes, tell him that's the one. Uh, very good, sir. My right, dear Watson, times like these you should tell your man never to take the first cab that comes on call, nor yet the second. The third may be safe. But Holmes, I... All right, fine. Cabby, cabby. Cabby, cabby. Here is cabby. Here is. I write in this way. Ah, this bag. I want to take him down. Uh, all right, the street. Uh, all right. Uh, goodbye, Watson. Bye, Watson, old fellow. Uh, wait a minute, driver. It's pretty heavy, I'm afraid. Let me help you. Uh, the Watson. I'll write to you from Budapest. Yes, yes. But uh, here, driver. Just let me tighten up the straps a bit. There we are. That's right. I'll hold it, driver. You, you pull the strap. Two little things in this bag that I wouldn't like to lose. Aren't you, Watson? And it's just as well to make quite sure. Is it not, Professor Moriarty? By means of a simple pair of handcuffs. Last you, Holmes. Do you imagine, Sherlock Holmes, that this is the end? I ventured to dream that it might be. Are you quite sure the police will be able to hold me? Professor Moriarty, I'm quite sure of nothing. Take him away, Foreman. And so, my dear Watson, ends the strange case of Miss Alice Faulkner. Well, what about the letters? Oh, the letters. They were returned to their rightful owner over an hour ago. I suspected from the start that Miss Faulkner was really a nice girl at heart. Ah, oh, dear... What is it, Holmes? I'm just reflecting, my dear Watson. With Moriarty out of the way, London, from the point of view of the criminal expert, it's likely to become a singularly uninteresting city. One morning paper, veritable wilderness of boredom. Mr. Holmes, Mr. Holmes. And yes, Billy? There's a lady, sir. She's been waiting for an hour. Says she's got to see you, sir. Case of murder, she says. She's got a face veil. From which I deduce that she is a lady of over 41 and less than 45, of a strange, dark beauty and considerable social eminence, and that she has lived for some years in the Near East, and that she is now wearing a large blood ruby on the second finger of her left hand. Holmes, how do you know these things? It's amazing. Huh. Elementary, my dear Watson. Elementary. The child's play of deduction. <laughs> Again tonight, the Columbia Broadcasting System, through its affiliated stations coast to coast, has brought you Orson Welles and the Mercury Theatre on the Air. The twelfth production in this unique series featuring Broadway's and radio's most celebrated theatrical producing company. This evening, the play was Orson Welles' own adaptation of William Gillette's Sherlock Holmes. In the cast, Dr. Watson, played by Ray Collins. 
Alice Faulkner by Mary Taylor, Madge Larrabee by Brenda Ford, James Larrabee by Edgar Barrier, Inspector Foreman by Morgan Farley, Fagan by Richard Wilson, Rassick by Alfred Shirley, Larry by William Allen, Billy by Arthur Anderson, Professor Moriarty by Eustace Wyatt, and Sherlock Holmes by Orson Welles. The orchestra was conducted by Bernard Herman, and the production was supervised for CBS by Davidson Taylor. Your announcer is Frank Gallup. <laughs> same time, another classic narrative dramatized by Orson Welles. Join us then for Charles Dickens' Oliver Swift, brought to life by the Mercury Theatre on the air. Welcome back. You know, I, I have to say, there is a ton of action uh, in this uh, particular play. Um, and, and really, th- this this really is definitionally when the Mercury Theater does it. Uh, you can tell uh, it, it's truly a play. In, in some of these ways, when, when we listen to regular episodes, it sounds like uh, we are we are sitting there and we are, you know, uh, they're doing uh, an early TV show. But at this point, they're sitting there and they're doing this play over the radio. Um and there's so much, you know, I think this was a very cool Sherlock Holmes. Um, absolutely uh, self-assured. A man not only of thought, but of action. Uh, maybe in this in this uh, little play, more action than thought. The interplay between Holmes and Moriarty, that was kind of kind of dicey. Uh, it almost gets to a point uh, with... Uh, with those guys that they seem just to sit there and try and find ways to, uh, you know, uh, basically they're so intelligent they end up doing some stupid things, particularly um, Moriarty. But Holmes triumphs in in the end. Uh, And I think a great performance by Orson Welles. Um, One thing that made this uh, performance, I think, so notable on on the part of Orson Welles is that when he did this, he was actually only 23. Incredible performance by such, a, really, a, a young actor. Um, and I think, you know, it's the magic of his voice combined with the magic of radio that allowed him to be, even be able to do this. You would never cast a 23-year-old uh, as Sherlock Holmes. Uh, but he pulled it off brilliantly, and you couldn't t- even tell listening to it. I was pre- very sure not to mention it during the uh, first part to kind of wonder to see if people would realize. So, And we're going to get into an episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. But before we do get started, I want to encourage you, uh, please uh, cast your vote for us over at Podcast Alley. That's podcastalley.greatdetectives.net. Uh, the sooner we get those votes in, uh, the better the chance we have of attracting listeners to a high ranking. Uh, because say we get, say up to number, uh, 50 and then we go, you know, down, um, that's better than slowly, you know, tr- having votes trickle in throughout the month. So, particularly if you don't have a specific comment, but you just enjoy the show, you don't have to leave a comment. Just put podcastalley.greatdetectives.net into your uh, browser, you can go there, you can cast your vote. Uh, it's really, uh, really appreciate that as a good way to support the program. Also, please fill out survey, survey.greatdetectives.net. Um, now, I will let you know that these shows that are done the same week are going to, are going to come to, uh, an end. Uh, we've basically been about six, uh, six to seven weeks ahead. And using these shows to kind of have an anchor so we can get to your comments in a quicker method. Well, we're going to go back to, we're going to go to a rule that they used on uh, Yours Truly Johnny Dollar uh, during the Bob Bailey era. They actually recorded their shows 
three weeks ahead. Well, if that's good enough for them, it's good enough for us. So we'll be recording three weeks ahead, and we'll basically be doing full weeks so that uh, each episode of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, we don't just do all the comments on that because th that's kind of uneven for the uh, fans of the program. So uh, that's coming next year, though. Uh, we do have some comments we'll get to today. Scott uh, uh, writes on the uh, uh, blog at greatdetectives.net, I've been struggling with the home shows. The audio quality doesn't seem as good as the other programs. I know from working my way through the Dragnet series that there were some earlier shows where the sound quality made listening difficult at times. Will the trend be similar for Sherlock Holmes? Well, thanks so much. Um, I, I think there were two different issues. Certainly, some of the Dragnet episodes had some sound quality issues, uh, but the big thing was uh, my lack of expertise in dealing with audio. Um, and I actually have uh, uploaded a couple replacements uh, where I, I took out the show clip because there were echoes and it, uploaded a cleaner copy uh, on the Dragnet show. Uh, what we're dealing with is an issue of source material. Andrew Rodgers does a great job on our sound editing, uh, but there's a limit to what he can do when the, when the copy we've got is not up to par. Uh, and sadly, that's the case with some of the episodes out there, and we're always looking for the best copy. Uh, and sometimes, regardless of the show, uh, in this case, we're dealing with two, with a but with the last four or five episodes of Sherlock Holmes being very rare, uh, um, very old recordings. Uh, in the case of the Sherlock Holmes episodes, these are, have been more than 70 years old. Um, they'll get a little bit better uh, some, uh, on mi most of the Rathbone Bruce episodes we're, we're going to be getting into starting next week. I was actually very pleased with the quality on the first uh, Rathbone uh, Bruce episode we did from 39, uh, the Bruce Partington plans. Uh, but there'll always, there'll always be some variableness. Uh, like today's episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, is not the greatest, uh, greatest audio. I searched about five different sources to see if I could find uh, a better episode. Fortunately, it's just not out there. Um, and that's kind of limit. Uh, some of it's just because we, we use what is available and we won't, you know, use something from a commercial site where they make their business uh, retouching and clean, cleaning these episodes up and making them good sound quality. Simply not something we do because that's a service they offer and we don't want to undercut them in uh, providing that. Um, I'm not even aware, though, of any Charles Russell episodes that anyone's uh, cared enough to remaster. So, uh, yeah. Uh, on some of this, it's just the quality of uh, the quality of the underlying media. Uh, but I think you'll like some of these Sherlock Holmes episodes we're about to do better. All right, we got an email from Leslie in Australia, a long-time listener. Uh, and she writes that I'm right about Lewis Hector as Sherlock Holmes. From his first episode, the voice had bothered me. It didn't sound right, but there was a familiar quality to it. W.C. Fields trying to be serious or sober is spot on. Uh... And she has a question as well. Have you heard of the Green Llama? I was listening to an episode of the Old Time Radio Daily Western, and an old ad came on for a program called the Green Llama. It sounded something like the Shadow, a detective who had learned uh, special powers in Tibet, training as a llama. Did this show as exist, uh, or has someone put the ad in as a joke? Um, well, in answer to that question, yes, it absolutely did exist. Uh, it ran for 11 weeks uh, from June 5th to August 20th of 1949. Didn't really catch on. Uh, of the 11 episodes made, five are still in existence. Um, I included a link, sent it to Leslie, I'll include it in the show notes, uh, to the Digital Deli, um, where uh, they've got actually a very complete article on this short series. That's one of the things they do. Uh, that's one of their specialties is writing uh, articles about these shorter uh, these shorter shows. Uh, but the Green Lawn was out there. It was a little different from The Shadow uh, in that uh, The Shadow's actual Eastern um, powers were kind of an, an afterthought. It added in for radio. Because in the books, The Shadow actually, he just hid behind things. Uh, but when they got to the point of adapting the shadow for re radio, they didn't want to sit there and explain. Now, the shadow's behind that crate. 
and he's hidden very well behind the crate, and they can't see him. That just doesn't work for radio. So then they introduced the power to cloud men's minds. Um, with the Green Llama, it was always somewhat an aid. But um, I'm going to include a link to the Digital Delis article for those of you who are curious. And you can take a listen. He's got two sample episodes of the five uh, that are in circulation. So you can get an idea of what that series was about. Uh, finally, before we get to the show, got a question about making an, uh, an app for, uh, for the shows, um, but was wondering if I could do, um, do something um, in terms of, uh, uh, of a video for the podcast for users of Nano and stuff. That, unfortunately, we don't have a whole lot of control over the app. It's kind of, uh, it's something that's set up for general uh, podcast work. We don't have a whole lot of alteration ability on that. But I appreciate that. That was a Podcast Alley comment, so thanks for that. Please cast your votes, uh, comments. Uh, we've got more to get to in a moment. I um, encourage you, and we'll have a little say about this after we get back, but please remember johnnydollarair.com when scheduling your flights. Uh, and making any travel arrangements uh, around, over the holidays or after the holidays. It's a great way to save money on airline travel and also uh, to, uh, uh, to support the great detectives of old time radio. All right, well, today's episode takes Johnny Dollar on his first trip uh, to England, and he makes several trips in the course of his long and uh, uh, an illustrious detective career, this first one, uh, over a matter of some stolen portraits. So let's go ahead and get into the stolen portrait. Time now for Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> The next half hour has its baggage packed to take a trip with America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. At insurance investigation, he's just an expert. At making out his expense account, he's an absolute genius. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Frederick Kimball, General Manager of Fine Arts Insurers Incorporated, New York, New York. The following is an accounting of my expenditures in the investigation of the stolen portrait of the Duke of Masson. Or, who opened the season on canvas back Duke? <laughs> Expense account, item one. $350, plane fare, New York to London. Item two, $125, replacement, brand new light tan top coat, borrowed and not returned by fellow passenger during flight. We had cleared Gander, Newfoundland, and were four hours out, flying at 20,000 feet over the Atlantic, with a knife in the weather, fighting it out to see which could darken the sky first. Most of the passengers were asleep, but the rough weather was giving the man in the seat beside me a rough time. Although the plane had leveled off, his dinner was still trying to gain altitude. Among other things, he complained of chills, so I slipped out of my top coat and threw it around his shoulders. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry to be such a bother. Oh, oh, oh I... I think I'll try a drink of water. Okay, I'll bust the steward. No, don't bother. She's up forward. Maybe they walked back. Too far. He stepped out for a breath of fresh air. I didn't think anybody could get sick enough to do that. By the time I got to the back of the ship, the rear seat passengers were milling around the aisle, all of them claiming not to know anything about what had happened. I didn't either. But if my ex-friend hadn't jumped out of the plane, he'd been pushed. And that posed this tantalizing question. If he'd been pushed, and since he'd been wearing my light tan top coat, was I the one who was supposed to be taking that 20,000-foot swan dive into the Atlantic? I looked over the passengers, and to me, they all looked guilty. But I knew they couldn't be. I also knew I had no chance of finding out which one was. When things settled down, everybody started asking the stewardess for sedatives to help them get back to sleep. I asked her for some black coffee to keep awake. <laughs> By four o'clock the next afternoon, I was in good health in London and in the office of your policyholder, Dexter Morley. Yes, I've been expecting you, Dollar. Your company cabled that you were coming. They're very generous of them to send you all the way over here to help. 
The way I have to pay at my expense account to make an honest living. Don't ever accuse my clients of generosity. Oh? Oh, no. They aren't being soft-hearted benefactors. They're being hard-headed businessmen. If that painting stays lost, it'll cost them $250,000. Well, I'd better brief you from the beginning. Oh, if I yawn during your story, Morley, don't mind. I'm just sleepy. I see. Very well, I'll make a brief, Dollar. Well, during my lifetime, I have developed an overwhelming appreciation for fine painting. Unfortunately, I have not been able to develop the fortune that should go with it. As a result, I haven't only not been able to buy any great paintings, I've not been able to afford to travel to the museums around the world where the great masterpieces hang. Well, I guess there must be a lot of people stuck in the same fix. Exactly, and that's what gave birth to my plan. I have organized what you might call the Masterpiece of the Month Club. Its members are 12 of the top museums and galleries in the world. This plan calls for them to rotate their most famous paintings. In other words, if the people can't afford to come to the pictures, my scheme brings the pictures to the people. A new one, every month. Well, that's very interesting, Mr. Morley. But uh, let's talk about the one that got away. Oh, yes, of course. I was merely outlining the background of this case to delineate my responsibility in the matter. Well, so now we know that you feel personally responsible for the loss of the painting, even though it's well insured. Mr. Dollar, no amount of money can get that picture repainted by the man who originally painted it. The artist Bonnet has been dead for more than 300 years. Oh, a real gone guy. Now, if we fail to recover Bonnet's masterpiece, the Duke of Masson, it would not only be a tremendous shock, but also a tremendous loss to the world of art. Further, it would ruin my reputation. The very first thing to be loaned arrives here in London from Paris four days ago, and the first night after I deliver it to the museum, it is stolen off their wall. Okay, Mr. Morley. <laughs> So much for the story. Where's the museum? It's the New Art Gallery at Coventry. Uh, here's the address. I won't be able to accompany you myself as I'm flying across the channel immediately to try to calm the officials in Paris, the ones who loan the stolen painting. Uh, they've been calling incessantly. I'll phone my assistant, Miss Harding, to meet you at the main entrance in the museum in, let's say, uh, 45 minutes. Okay. Tell her I'll be the man asleep on the step. <laughs> Expense account, item three, sixpence eighty, London papers. To read while waiting for Miss Harding at museum entrance. No matter what I told Mr. Morley, I was afraid to go to sleep. Page one of each newspaper referred to my reason. The misadventure which had occurred on the plane the night before. A possible attempt on my life. Then along came another good reason for my lids not drooping. Miss Harding was an eye-opener. <laughs> Speaking in artistic terms, no painter could completely capture her dimension. A sculptor could come closer. As far as I was concerned, so could she. And she did. Would you see Mr. Dollar? It would indeed. I'm Miss Harding. Mr. Morley indicated that I might find you asleep. I say that must have been a shocking experience on the way over. Oh, not only shocking, but frustrating. Oh? Yes, there was nothing much that could be done. We circled long enough to drop a few life rafts, some flares, and a big blob of yellow oil to help mark the spot. Then all the pilot could do was call for the air sea rescue boys and hope. Yes, it's been in all the papers the whole day. Poor chap. Yeah. It could be that there, but for the grace of a light tan top coat, go I. What was that? Oh, nothing. Well, uh, shall we go museum prowling? Yes, of course, though. Well, oh, there isn't much to see. Just a blank space on the wall. Well, let's take a look anyway. Hey. Did you say a blank space on the wall? Why, yes. You mean they stole the painting frame and all? Indeed, they did. Oh. Art thieves are doing things the hard way these days. Usually, they just cut the painting out of the frame, stick it to the coat, and make a getaway. Yes, Mr. Dollar, I know. But perhaps this job was done by a beginner, or perhaps the burglar was interrupted and had to make a run for it, frame and all. There are infinite possibilities. Yes, yeah. infinite. Thanks. Mr. Dollar... Frankly, I think this trip here to the museum is an utter waste of time. I've gone over the whole situation with a gentleman from Scotland Yard. It wasn't so much as a single fingerprint. Miss Harding, I have yet to solve a case with a fingerprint. Oh, sorry, I forgot. Men just can't stand to be any show of efficiency in a woman. Oh, I wouldn't say that. It's according to what they are applying their efficiency. I'm speaking of business. Mr. Dollar, I'm sure that I can save you a great deal of trouble. I've already done an extraordinary amount of research on this case. Well, be careful what you tell me, Miss Harding. At this point, I confuse easily. Mr. Dollar, a child could understand what I have to tell you. Sometimes a wide-awake child is better than a sleepy man. But go ahead. Well, now, this is the place right here. Oh. There. You see? A blank wall. 
Now, Mr. Dollar, of the 12 foremost RTs in London, I have discovered that nine are currently in prison, one is in hospital after falling four stories off a roof, and the other two are at large and may be found residing at the addresses I have here. Hey, you sound more like a patron of the criminal courts than you do of the arts. The entire subject of criminality fascinates me. Now, have you seen enough of your blank wall? Yep, things are blank enough. Give me those addresses. And while you're at it, maybe you better give me yours. Mr. Dollar, you don't think I look suspicious? Oh, no. Delicious. Spencer Cow, item four. Five shillings. Cab fare to Scotland Yard. Tip to driver, two bob. When it comes to money, I speak all languages. Scotland Yard from the outside looks like a big public school. Well, it has taught a lot of lessons to a lot of people. Inside, it was tea time. When I inquired for the officer in charge of the robbery with which I was concerned, I was led to an Inspector Carew. First, he gave me a cup of tea. Then he gave me my lunch. Mr. Dollar, you sit here and ask me why we haven't done something. Believe me, sir, the yard is not as archaic as its architecture. There's a simple legal procedure which must occur before we can make either an investigation or an arrest. Well... First, a complaint must be lodged by the legal owners of any stolen property. At that point, and at that point only, are we allowed to act. You mean nobody called for help? Well, naturally, when the museum discovered the painting gun, they immediately rang us up. We went to court to gather primary evidence. Unfortunately, there was none. Well, what about the owners of the painting, the museum in Paris? As yet, we've heard nothing. We expect to momentarily. Uh, Inspector, just out of curiosity, what about this girl, Miss Harding? I'd say she's, uh, well, uh... A jolly fine type. I mean, do you know anything about her? I say, didn't you Yanks carry off enough of our girls after the war? I'm not in the importing business. I mean, is she known to you professionally? What? You suspect her? Mm, well, not particularly, but uh, she did give me this list. In her opinion, this is the who's who and where they are of your city's light-fingered art lovers. Hmm, let me see it. <sighs> well, quite complete and quite accurate. Hardly the work of an amateur. Where in the world would a young lady like Miss Harding come into such information? That, Inspector Carew, is exactly what I'm driving at. Back in a taxi headed from Scotland Yard on my way to check into the Mount Royal Hotel, I gave my eyes a rest at the risk of missing the sightseeing, but my mind refused to follow suit. It now had three blank walls to stare into. The one in the museum, the one at Scotland Yard... And the most provocative of the three to look at, the girl who knew too much, Miss Muriel Harding. My mind also kept ruffling my nerve ends with a question. Was I supposed to be the guy who got dumped out of that plane the night before? We arrived at the Mount Royal Hotel, and I got my answer. Here we are, sir. That's the Mount Royal, right? Dead on it. Oh, so well, you can't miss it. Okay. What's the bill? Uh, to you, sir. <laughs> That'll be off the crowd. How much? Two and six, sir. Oh, here. You, you figure it out. <laughs> Oh, there it is, Governor. Look out, Governor, more than that car. That was a close one. You all right, Governor? Yeah. Blimey, since the cars are back on the street, it's more dangerous to walk around now than it was when them ruddy buzz bombs were dropping. Yeah, a couple of good things about the buzz bombs, though. Nobody aimed them at you personally, and nobody was at the wheel to steer them. That made it official. I had been set up for a pigeon. And it was me somebody had tried to turn into a seagull during that flight across the Atlantic. Expense account item five. Three pounds ten. The bellboy for services rendered. How about that? Fourteen bucks for a bottle of scotch. I knocked off forty winks. It felt like only twenty. Then I grabbed a shower, a shave, and a cab down Oxford Street and over to Soho. Expense account item six. Five shillings. The legal limit on the price of dinner in England these days. I ate in a nice place called Ketner's, dinner being a bit of chicken, three choices of vegetables. Brussels sprouts boiled, Brussels sprouts creamed, and Brussels sprouts roasted. For dessert, I looked at the names and addresses of Miss Harding's two candidates for the boys most likely to have succeeded in swiping the missing portrait of the Duke of Masson. I was in the right district for one of them. I found myself on a dark and lonely mews. That may sound good to you, but in Soho, a mews is still only a place fit for ash cans and cats. I broke my way up the stairs of the address of the number one boy on Miss Harding's list. On the top step, I was breathing hard. I wasn't all from the climb. I clenched my teeth and my knuckles and knocked on the door. 
Then I brought roll two, the basic instructions for the working snoop. I opened the door. Huh. That lock never went to Yale. The door of a wood-burning stove across the room was open, the flames erratically painting the walls with orange light, then erasing them back into black darkness. I finally dared to breathe. Then I saw what I was looking for, lying on a table, its edges curled upward, an oil painting of a guy with short breeches and a long face. I started forward, but something barred my foot. I stared down at the floor in front of me. First it was pitch black, then the light from the stove flared up, and I saw that the object was what it... I thought it was, and hoped it wasn't, a man wearing his head, and I don't mean his hair, parted in the middle. I rushed across the room, flipped the door off the top of the stove to give me more light, and looked for a telephone. There was none in the room with a corpse, so I tried the door of the next room. And the door I was trying started erupting. just a moment, we'll turn to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. But first, we want to remind you that those delightful, charming neighbors, Ozzie and Harriet, are coming back home next Sunday night, coming back to CBS. You'll be able to join them on most of these same stations at 6.30 Eastern Standard Time, just before the Jack Benny Show. Ozzie and Harriet now have their own sons, Ricky and David, playing themselves in place of the young actors who formerly portrayed them. So make it a party for your whole family when Ozzie and Harriet, Ricky and David, come home with their fun and laughter to CBS next Sunday night. And now, back to yours truly, Johnny Dollar. When those bullets came crashing through the door at me, I dropped to the floor. I still don't know whether my knees buckled or I meant to go down. I stayed where I was. But whoever it was on the other side of that door decided to take off. Out the window. I to my feet, but by the time I kicked the door open and got to the window, I had that old Mother Hubbard feeling. The cupboard was bare. And that's what I'm doing here in your flat, Miss Harding. After my little adventure, the first thing I did was to call the police. And the second was to come here to call on you, the girl who steered me into that shooting gallery. Well, you needn't sound so annoyed at me. Of course, I advise you to go there, but after all, it was your duty, and you did recover the picture. And almost lost my health doing it for the third time. Really? Yes, really. First, somebody tried to make a sea-going paratrooper out of me. Then they tried to make me part of the pavement by running me down with an auto. And now tonight, somebody on the other side of a door tries to turn it into my personal copy of the Pearly Gates. That's really enough for me. Mr. Dollar, where is the painting now? At Scotland Yard. And now let's change the subject back. What's bothering me is bothering me plenty. I want to know who didn't want me to find that picture, and why. Why, it seems elementary. Thank you, Dr. Watson. The thief naturally didn't want you to find it. Miss Harding, please. When I got shot at, the apparent thief was dead. Well, they do have henchmen, you know. If he was killed by an accomplice, why did the killer leave the painting? Oh, I'd have no way of knowing. Of that, I'm still not sure. Oh, really, Mr. Dollar, come off it. You hardly suspect me. I suspect you left if you'd stop saying that. At this point, I suspect everyone. Even Dexter Morley, dreaming up this whole painting of the month scheme to bring those paintings within stealing distance. Oh, but that's utterly yes, ridiculous. I know, I know. If that was the plan, he'd wait until he had more than one picture on the road to steal. That's why I don't suspect him. Well, frankly, I don't see why you continue to worry. After all, your part of the job is done, isn't it? Yeah, I suppose you're right. But I still have a yearning burning deep down inside of me to break somebody's neck. Mind if I use your phone? Of course not. Help yourself. All right. Hello, I, I want to talk to New York. Oh. Yeah, don't worry, I'll call Collect. My name is Johnny Dollar. I want to place a Collect call to New York. Number is Plaza 69184. Check this, please, sir. Your name is John Dollar. New York number you are calling is Plaza 69184. And the call is uh, Collect, correct? Correct, Collect. Right you are, sir. We shall ring up immediately if there's a clear circuit. Thank you. Well, they'll call me. Well, while you're waiting, you'll probably do with a bracelet. Would you care for a drink? Mm, what have you got? Oh, gin and orange, gin and lemon, gin and Italian, or gin French. No whiskey. No, thanks. Well, come and sit down over here. Very restful. Much more restful on the eyes where I am. Here, I can have a better look at you. However, 
Why, Mr. Dolly, you can be charming. Do you mind if I change the Mr. for Johnny? It sounds much more fun. Well, I'll swap you one Johnny for every Muriel you let me use. It's a bargain. Now, tell me about yourself. You're looking up fascinating. I'm an absolute bug on criminology. At the moment, Muriel, that happens to be my unfavorite subject. Let's talk about you. Mm, where shall I begin? Mm, just after the age of 21? Mm, you're a saucy type. At the age of 21, I was serving in the where? Huh? The Women's Air Force. Oh, you must have had a lot of exciting adventures. Mm, rather. What was the most exciting? Oh, I think perhaps the night the young U.S. Air Force captain kissed me. Oh, one of the boys of the wild blue yonder. Maybe it was the blue of your eyes that made him wild. Johnny. I know how he must have felt. Please, Johnny. <gasps> uh, I'll be right back. All right, darling. Hello? Are you there? Are you there? Of course I'm here. Mr. Dollar? That's right. We're ready with your call to New York. We shall signal at the end of three minutes. Are you ready to talk? The minute you stop. Right you are, sir. Carry on. Hello? Hello. Is this the Fine Arts Insurers? I want to talk to Mr. Kimball. Yes, 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 Dollar. I'm on the line. Go ahead. Well, you can stop worrying, Kimball. I got the painting back. You say you did get it back? That's right. It's safe. All you'll have to pay is the price of a new frame. What's that you say? What happened to the frame? Well, the guy who swiped it took the painting out of the frame. I don't know where it is. Well, ask the culprit what he did with it. I can't. He's dead. Well, then look for it. That frame itself is worth $10,000. Okay, Fred, don't blow out any bridge work. I'll look around for it. Give it everything you've got, Dollar. Huh, I'm too near doing that already. What do you say? Okay, Fred, I'll cable you what happens. Goodbye. Well, Muriel, vacation's over. I just got put back to work. I gather from your conversation they want to send you chasing off into the night to look for the picture frame. Yeah, that's it. Oh, it's ridiculous. The police have probably already found it somewhere in that fellow's flat. Mm, I'll check that. But my work is personal service. Mm, but... Oh, must you go, Johnny? It's only half past ten. Couldn't you put it off till morning? Well, there's nothing I'd like better, but... Couldn't you stay even for a little while? Well, just long enough to calm my nerves. Big Ben was ringing up midnight on Time's greedy cash register. When I finally cleared with a bobby guarding the back alley flats, but had not so long before given up one unprecious life and one very precious painting. The place was darker than it had been on my previous visit, and when I groped for the electric switch, I realized why. There had been a brisk fire blazing before. In the bottom grate of the stove, I found enough unburned portions of the hot picture frame to justify my conclusions. And I found something else that came under the category of hot rocks. Expense account, item seven. Cab fare, the office of Dexter Morley. The front door was not only locked, it was barred. However, at the back of the building, I had better luck. A loose window down to the basement. I just broke a law, but I didn't want to break my neck, so I snapped on a light. The basement was loaded with cabinet-making equipment. But for my dough, they weren't making any cabinets. I was bench with a power drill, and on the floor below it, a pile of sawdust and wood shavings. That was normal enough, but the sawdust pile was glinting with tiny specks of crystallized glue. With what I had now, all I had to find was Dexter Morley. He made that easy. He found me. Stay down there, Dollar. Right where you are. Well, welcome home from that trip to Paris you didn't take. That gun in your hand suggests that I'm right about one thing, anyway. Yes, and what would that be? That whoever took the shot me earlier tonight was probably not an Englishman. The bobbies over here don't carry guns, which makes most English mugs afraid to. You're American. That's interesting, but hardly valuable. I've got some more. How valuable is this? I think you're in on, or at the head of, a very high-class smuggling racket. And I think you set up that painting of the month scheme of yours to establish just about the neatest method of smuggling that I've ever heard of. You're very generous. I know how I operate, so what you could tell me about it could do nothing more than bore me. What I want from you are the diamonds. Maybe I can trade you. Some diamonds for some answers. You're in no position to bargain. Give me the diamonds or I'll shoot you and take them off you. No, wait a minute. I'd better explain my bargaining position. I think you'll admit it's not the worst. Since you've followed me here, you know I took a cab from the murder flat. One without a taillight, so you don't have the number. But, brother, I do. And the diamonds are jammed down behind its back seat. Now, let's bargain. What? You... 
All right. What do you want to know? Well, just let me do the guessing and check me if I'm wrong. You set up a chain of famous paintings which would move around the world through your branch offices. As each one passed through your hands here, the frame was to be dismantled and holes bored in it at the joints for the purpose of smuggling diamonds. Right so far? Yes, Stella, right. But remember, the more you are right about, the worse it is for me. So naturally, the worse it is for you. We'll take care of that later. This scheme of yours fascinates me. The stuff moves around the world in the picture frames, under official armed guard, and enjoying virtual diplomatic immunity through customs. It's great. Uh, it would have been great if it hadn't been for that heavy-handed oak. Oh, that fills in a missing link. From out of the night comes a burglar, steals your first loaded picture, shoves the frame into his stove to get rid of it. You arrive, cream him with your gun, then I arrive, interrupting you before you get what you want out of the burning frame, and then... You saw what happened to him when he resisted me, Dollar. But now you must realize that I won't hesitate a moment. It works the other way, doesn't it? You kill me, who tells you the number of that taxi? And without it, you'll never get your diamonds. There are ways. Keep your hands behind you! Painful. I thought so. Your head will wear out before this gun barrel does... Now, feel more like talking? Just enough to tell you one more thing. You can tell that blonde accomplice of yours I was on to her from the start. Tony, what do you mean? What? Ow! Don't shoot back! I can't repay you for those three tries you made or had made on my life, Morley. But here's what it feels like being hit on the head with a gun. Yeah, rockabye booby. Muriel, look out, you'll fall. I told you, that's a very undignified way for a lady to enter a room through a basement window. Johnny, I was only trying to help, and and there you were accusing me of being his accomplice after all those nice things you said to me before. Whoa, wait a minute. Oh, I followed you. I I wanted to see how you were. Oh, great, you and your criminology. At least you might have stepped in before he hit me those two licks. Look at my head. Oh, I'm sorry, Johnny, it's... It's just that I love crime. Well, come on, get up. Oh. Would be a crime if Mr. Worley there woke up and I had to put him back to sleep again before the police got here. Well, what was it all about? It was about these little black things. I've got a pocket full of them. Here, scrape one of them with your fingernail. Oh, glass. Honey, that's the kind of glass a fellow hands his girl when he wants to be engaged to marry her. Johnny, darling, you mean... Uh, yes, I mean only that they're diamonds. Expense account, item eight, $350. Plane fare out of attempted matrimony by the party of the second part. Item nine, $25. Gift to Muriel Harding. Two books, one on the art of crime, the other on the art of cookery in the hopes that the latter might attract her to the pursuit of a more womanly hobby. Item 10, 10 cents. Roma Seltzer. Purchased upon landing at Gander, Newfoundland. The only thing still fighting me on this case were those Brussels sprouts I had at dinner in London the night before. Expense account total, $1,563.40. If you find any slight discrepancy in this amount, in my favor... Blame it on my confusion and lack of understanding of the international rate of exchange. The only thing I'd like to exchange at this point is my head with its two new lumps. Wishing you the same, yours, uh, truly, Johnny Dollar. In just a moment, more about Johnny Dollar. But first, Academy Award winner Jane Wyman comes as guest to the Family Hour of Stars. And Ozzie and Harriet return in triumph to CBS. These are two headline-making events for next Sunday night. Add these two shows to the top comedy of Jack Benny, the feminine charm and dramatic talent of Helen Hayes and Eve Arden, the ace comedy teams of Amos and Andy and Lemon Abner, and CBS Sunday night makes great news. On top of this, There are the notable mystery capers with Sam Spade and the laughter with Life with Luigi and It Pays to be Ignorant. So don't miss a single one of CBS 10 great entertainment next Sunday night when they're heard over most of these same stations. Jack Benny, of course, comes to you over them all.
Listen in again next week when CBS brings you Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, with Charles Russell as Johnny. Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar is written by Paul Dudley and Gil Dow, with music by Mark Warno, and is produced and directed by Richard Sandville for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Welcome back. You know, one thing I noticed, the titles that uh, are given at the beginning of the show, um, when people are making logs and things of that sort, they never use the, uh, or try to avoid the outlandish titles that uh, Johnny Dollar uh, uh, in the Charles Russell episodes gives, gives these adventures. Uh, the only exceptions are those in which uh, the episode's not in existence. So you look in the newspaper and you see the title of the show, and you see, and in the newspaper it says, "Press out the asbestos dinner jacket, mother. I'm going to smoke," and that's in the newspaper. Um, and you don't have the show to go ahead and come up to know the plot and to come up with an acceptable alternative. Now I'm not gonna rename them to what he actually said in the show, uh, because I'm not going to be that big of a contrarian with the way these shows have been titled. Still, it's kind of interesting. He gives a title, and people are like, no, 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 people aren't going to take the show seriously if you, you, you call it something like that. Uh, this, was, this was actually a pretty ingenious uh, smuggling scheme. Um, and uh, a very surprising turnabout from the art theft. Uh, of course, uh, in this episode, throughout it, Johnny Dollar was uh, completely wrong uh, because he didn't suspect the guy who had uh, ordered the uh, painting at first. He was very clear he didn't suspect him until evidence changed to the uh, uh, to indicate it. So, and the first love interest he escaped. Um, I don't know. I guess he was afraid of marrying into Mr. and Mrs. North or something. Uh, all right. Well, we got some more comments, emails. I did want to let you, uh, let you know a little bit more, uh, just briefly remind her about uh, Johnny Dollar Air. Uh, the cost of a one-way flight, Russell uh, listed here, as $350. Uh, now, $350 in today's money is $2,555. That's a reminder of why it's important to use JohnnyDollarAir.com. With JohnnyDollarAir.com, a one-way ticket from New York to London is available for $517. Uh, so please remember JohnnyDollarAir.com. All right, now to the comments we got. Uh, this one uh, came in. Shannon uh, emails in. And she and she asked, um, uh, "You have all my." She says, "You have all my favorites on here, and it's so nice to just turn one on when I am needing to relax." I first started listening to old time radio when I had satellite radio, and found all of these classics. What about the Saint? Is there any room for those? Yeah, the Saint is a is one of those characters we we'll definitely consider doing. Um, I think that there are some shows that are kind of similar in a way, in a way and obviously there's there's some variations here. Um, the the I would probably put the Saint, Nick Carter, Master Detective, and Mystery is My Hobby, all kind of in these same soft boiled uh, shows. So we probably won't show more than one of them at once. Uh, but I'd appreciate listener feedback if you've got. Uh, a preference between those three. Obviously, this is several years off uh, when we'll actually get to putting those into the lineup, but that's one we'll definitely uh, want to to run. Vincent Price was pretty good in that one, so thanks for the comment, Shannon. All right, and finally got a very nice note. I meant I I, I avoided getting to it because I intended to read it over on the Dragnet show, but and then I forgot. Uh, so I want to make sure I get it read. So we're going to go ahead and do it on uh, this show. This comes from Mark, who uh, writes in, I just wanted you to know that I stumbled across your show by accident while looking for a Dragnet ringtone for my cell phone, and it has opened a whole new world for me. When 
I was in college a few decades ago, there was a radio show on that I enjoyed but never followed closely. When I stumbled across, across Dragnet at iTunes and loaded the first few episodes on my iPod, an alternative to my music, I didn't realize what a life-changing experience I was embarking on. After listening to Dragnet for a while, I looked for other of my favorite detectives and found Sherlock Holmes, and your commentary has led me to a load of other great detective uh, uh, radio shows like Johnny Dollar. Now I've branched out into other uh, shows like Gunspoke and The Great Westerns. One show I digested almost as quickly as Dragnet was Tales of the Texas Rangers, which has a very similar format. Uh, and I will highly recommend to Dragnet fans. And that's actually a good recommendation, a very solid uh, police uh, procedural. Uh, so now, whenever I need a bit of entertainment, I'm as likely to turn on my iPod or iTunes as the television. One thing great about these shows uh, is the window into history and the fact that my mind's eye can produce scenery and effects that Hollywood can never match. A sincere thank you for opening a new world for me to enjoy. Well, thanks a lot, Mark. And that's one thing I've kind of reflected on. Uh, the radio shows, to me, seem less old than the television of the same era. Uh, just because you can paint your own uh, pictures. You can imagine the actors dressed however you want to imagine them dressed. The scenery, uh, as he said, uh, you can do it. And some of the uh, TV scenery and movie scenery was just not up to par. Uh, but you can't imagine things in Technicolor, uh, which uh, makes it uh, a lot nicer. So, all right, well, we're going to wrap this up. i got any comments, please send them my way, box13 at greatdetectives.net, uh, and go over to podcastalley.greatdetectives.net. And for all of your travel needs, remember, johnnydollarair.com. That's johnnydollarair.com. Uh, from Boise, Idaho, though, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.